Hello, everyone. Check, check, check. One, one, two, two. one, two. Can you hear me? If someone wants to just, like, tell me whether we've got to adjust this in the chat, because it's been six months and we have to do this every time. Pull up from the talking hands. Echo. Okay. Echo's gone. Audio is good. Fantastic. Oh, well, it's great to see everybody back. I know it's been six months since we did our last workbench stream, but an opportunity has presented itself, which is very exciting. Um, if you saw the teaser on what we're planning to do today, we have a very exciting project, which is something that I've wanted to do for a really long time, which is to build uh, an 8-bit single board computer in the style of the late 1970s or early 1980s. Um, and it just so happens that today we have a kit that was produced by a good friend of mine called Derek. Um, we are going to be attempting to build the kit for the first time, um, both my first time and also the kit's first time, because the kit has not been built by anyone who isn't Derek prior to now. So it's going to be exciting. Um, I was sort of hoping that we weren't going to have instructions, but um, Derek has kindly provided me with a PDF of some instructions, which is probably going to help. Um, yeah, it's very exciting. Um, we probably won't get to the point where we have a functioning computer today, but we'll just have a go and see what happens. So I thought we might kind of have a look through the box of computer stuff and just sort of see what's in here. We'll split the parts out into their kind of related categories to make the assembly a bit easier and we'll make sure that there's nothing too horrendously missing. Um, and while we do that, we actually have a special guest for today's stream. The man himself, uh, Derek, is going to join us in a couple of minutes. And um, if you don't know Derek, you might have gone to a talk by him at ISIG in Wellington or at KawaiiCon. Um, you might have played a puzzle game at one of the KiwiCons in the past where Derek and Ellie put together the badge challenge puzzle, um, or you might have seen the Apollo 50th anniversary tweets that Derek and Ellie have been putting together on Twitter. Um, so do you want to, ah, here's Derek. Derek is in the chat. Fantastic. Um, do you want to, do you want to jump in Derek and say hello? Hello. Um, yeah, me, me getting technology to work today was a bit of a challenge, but here we are. Fantastic. Turns out these modern modern computers with modern six buttons are challenging for me. <laughs> yeah, it's understandable. Um, we're going to probably have to fiddle with the levels again, so if folks in chat can hear Derek all right, can <clears throat> we get a okay. thumbs up yeah, emoji? you can hear me saying stuff, um, and Fincham can wrangle the, the, the levels to make it sound good. What do we reckon? Nobody's paying attention. It's all right. That's fine. Or we can just, you know, start unboxing the box. Yeah, let's just have a look at what we've got. So I think the biggest and most exciting thing in here is probably going to be the PCBs as a starting point. So we'll have a quick look at that. The kit is broken down into two parts. We've got the compute board, which is the actual computer part of the computer. Um, and nicely everything is labeled, so we'll have a look at that. And we've got the user interface board. Okay, Trog says that the audio is good. We have succeeded. Um, oh, I, I'm going to see if we can just tweak the lighting a little bit, maybe make it less glary. No, okay, we're, we're stuck with glare. That's all we're getting. 
Um, yeah, so we've got the compute board, we've got the keyboard board, um, which is going to have switches, and it's going to have some LEDs for the display. Um, the boards are nicely silk screened with little kind of explanations of what all of the parts are. Um, we'll probably focus on this one today and we'll come back to that once we've kind of got a bit of the way through the computer construction. So we'll put this one away, I think. And we'll get this out of the way. And now it's just the rest of the stuff. So we've got, got labels to go on the keys. Indeed, all of the important letters are represented here. So I might just jump in at, at, at certain points and give some context. Yeah, go for it. Um, give us a, if you want to just give us a spiel maybe about what your kind of like motivation was behind designing this kit. Yeah, so I've been, I, I think as many a nerd, I've been wanting to do a, a 1970s style kit set since many years ago. And it was either do Z80 or 6502 or 6800 or, you know, that kind of a thing. And I came up through the Commodore 64 ranks, so therefore 6502 was kind of interesting. And then uh, I think a lot of people here would have seen Ben Eater on YouTube did a whole thing of um, 6502 machine. So about 18 months ago, I jumped on that bandwagon and started doing the Ben Eater um, design. But I hate breadboards. Breadboards just drive me insane with all the little wires and you sneeze and suddenly the whole machine stops. So I went straight to PCB. Um, a crowd called J JLC PCB, JCL PCB? Yeah, I think, J JLC, um, I think, yeah. That's the one. They have a, a whole web-based designer. So they've got an easy EDA that's all web-based. Um, so all the PCBs you see there are completely designed in their web UI and then you pay them a few bucks and they ship you boards in a week, which has been really, really useful. Um, I think amazing. I think to get to the point of the boards that you've got there, I think I'm, that's about like revision seven or eight. Um, my first two revisions simply did not go at all. Um, I think it was revision three or four before I even got a working machine. And at that point, it was very classic um Ben Eater design. And then more recently I've wrangled the design to be a bit more um a bit more RAM, a bit less ROM, a bit more IO, that kind of a thing. Um so yeah that's what's going on. And then the very concise alphabet you get um classic hexadecimal so zero to nine A to F. And then the R, W and X is for read, write and execute. So you can toggle stuff into memory or read what's in memory, or execute stuff in memory, and then there's a little enter key. Um, it's a pretty incredible period in history where you can legitimately say, I don't want the difficulty of using a breadboard, I'll just design this and get boards made, and that's not kind of such a ridiculous idea. Yeah, and I mean, it's there's several different companies in China all doing the same idea. If you send them files and they send you boards, for some reason that I don't understand, it's always five boards minimum, um, which is a bit wasteful if you're prototyping one board that doesn't work. You've now got like five boards that don't work. But they can turn around boards. I can send them files and I've got boards on my doorstep typically in about eight days, yeah. which is kind of nuts. That's pretty amazing. Um, and they will do... So all of the boards I'm doing are just um, double-sided boards, but they'll do like four-layer boards with all the really tidy silk screen, the whole, everything you could want. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty astounding. Stephen asks, is it cheating to have the creator of the kit helping assemble it? I mean, I'm not in the same room and I'm only gonna give so much help. So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> part, of this is, part of this is I have written, I've sketched out some rough build instructions that I've sent across. So Finchim's got to work from the book, and yeah. if he gets into trouble or I see him doing something wrong, I'm, well, um, I'm here we'll for the I'm here for the chaos, Derek. I'm here for the challenge. So excellent, excellent. Just having a look at what's in the box so far, um, we can eliminate a few of these things because we're not going to use them today, but um, we can have a quick look at them. So you've got 
these Kyle Chalk White key switches, um, which I am a super big fan of because they're incredibly satisfying. I don't know if you can hear that on the stream, but the click action on these is really nice. Um, any particular reason why you, you picked these? Just, just they're nice switches? Funnily enough, about a year ago, I said um, to you, I'm building a computer and I need some switches. What do you recommend? Oh, no. So that's kind of how we got here. Okay, cool. Well, great. You you, you selected my favorite key switches. Uh, we yeah, got... well, I was I was sort of mulling, should I just like Cherry MX or something? And mm. you said these are like lower profile and cheaper. So here we are. Yeah, they're really nice. Yep. And we've got nice blank key switches. So we'll put those aside because we're probably not going to get to the keyboard today. Um, similarly, we've got seven segment LEDs. A uh, huge fan of the aesthetic of these. I don't know what it is, but there's just something really comforting about like red seven segment LED displays. Um, yeah. Again, we'll probably get to those next time, so we'll put those aside. Hardware wise, I see you have very kindly provided sockets for everything, which is really good. And I'm not sure if this. I'm not sure if there's sockets for absolutely everything, but there should be sockets for most stuff. Okay, good, good. Um, particularly, I'm interested in this little dip socket, so let's have a quick look at that while we've got it out. Um, this is a thing I haven't seen before, is this uh, low-profile um, zip socket, which is quite interesting, because if you have uh, a normal kind of zip socket, they're pretty enormous. Um, in fact, yeah. I might even have one for comparison. Yeah, no, that, that low-profile Ziff, it's not actually that much taller than a regular socket, um, which is pretty damn cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I definitely want to... I feel like I'm going to gonna have to look at these, because if we look at... This is your, your standard kind of Ziff socket. Um, it's kind of this enormous, complicated thing with, like, lots of moving parts. So let's unbox this little guy and... See how that compares. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about your the things you like about the 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 six five zero two chip? Because I know historically there's been pretty hot competition in the kind of eight bit micro world. You know, particularly back in the day between six five zero two and Z eighty and you know the sixty eight oh nine. Is there kind of stuff that you think is really special about the six five zero two, Derek? Um, not really. I mean, I may, as I said, I mainly went 6502 just because I'm familiar. Um, I think architecture-wise, the whole zero-page magic on 6502 is kind of cool. You get any instruction that's manipulating RAM in the first 256 bytes, you, you've got a special zero-page version of the instruction that shaves the whole clock cycle off, whatever you're doing, um, which is, I think, somewhat unique. I don't believe any of the other chips of that era were doing that kind of stuff. But other than that, now there's, there, there was nothing specifically um, better about 6502 versus Z80. It was just I'm more familiar with it. Right. Um, I guess it's interesting to think about as well. Um, I know we talked about this a bit in the past. The, the sort of history of the 6502, like, um, you know, how it came to be such a popular and available chip for these micros? Um, well, I mean, a lot of that was price. It was a chap called Chuck Peddle was working at Motorola, and he went to his boss and said, I've got a way of making these chips cheaper with, like, less gates and less silicon, and they'll be a whole bunch cheaper. Mm. And his boss didn't want to buy of it with, yeah, but we're making a fortune selling these chips at $200 a piece. Why would we want to make them cheaper? So he ran off and started his own company of MOS Technologies, took a couple of Motorola people with them, built the 6502, and when they first took them to one of the trade shows and started selling them at $20 a piece, people were just confused. They're like, how can these be $20? This makes no sense. Um, and they sold a, an absolute bunch at that first show, and everyone, yeah, started doing exactly this, started doing kit sets. Because mm. if you're designing around a $200 CPU, you kind of want to get it right. But if you're prototyping with a twenty dollar part and you fry it, it's actually not that bad. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, really. And I mean, you know what? 
we I know the Commodore sixty four is a, a popular example of six five zero two machine. The Apple two also six five zero two. Yep. Um, the original ones? NES as six five zero two. NES. I think the Game Boy is Z eighty. Yes. Yeah. But there's there's still a lot of random embedded things are uh, based on six five zero two under the hood. Yeah. Um, and there is actually I can't remember the exact part number. There's a, like a six five eight one six or something that's essentially a sixteen bit code compatible. So when it powers up, it's in six five zero two mode, and then you twiddle some magic registers, and it kicks into um, sixteen bit mode with more advanced registers and more advanced instructions and stuff, um, which is something that I've thought about playing with as well at some point. Yeah, I think correct me if I'm wrong. That's a Western Design Center product. Correct. So I don't think Moss make six five zero twos anymore. Um, Do they some, still exist? Some, Somewhere in somewhere in the eighties, um, Western Design Center um, did the licensing and now make the chips. So the this this pack this kit is around the Western Design six five zero two, um, and you can still buy them for like whatever less than twenty bucks or about twenty bucks. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So we've got a bit more hardware here. We're probably not going to get to this today, so we'll put that with the keyboard. Some headers and jumpers. Uh, put those aside. Probably get the sockets aside as well because we, uh, well, we'll install a few of those today, but um, not straight away. Um, we've got one trillion resistors. I guess these are the LED current limiting resistors. Yeah, LED current limiting. Um, what value are those resistors? What size resistors did I give you? Are those 400 and some ohm? Yeah, these are the 430s. Um, yeah. I've I've built the last one of the one of the machines I built was with four thirty ohm. The display is quite a bit brighter than it needs to be. Right. Um. The most recent build I did, I'm using eight hundred and some eight hundred and whatever eight hundred and thirty. Um. And the display is perfectly good, so you could probably get away with all the way up at one k resistors. Right. Um. If you want, but it'll it'll work fine with the four thirty resistors. It'll just be kind of on the bright side. Cool. So the neat thing about this kit is that you've only got two resistor values in the whole kit, which is extremely convenient because yep. I'm not going to have to struggle and, you know, do my BB Roy and Great Britain mnemonic to figure out the values, which will be good and save everyone a bunch of time. I think there's one, we've got one tantalum capacitor in the kit. Is that right? Yep. And then all the other capacitors are also identical apart from the one tantalum. Oh, yep. great. So these are all the same value too. Cool. Easy. Yep. Oh, this is such a friendly kit. It's, it's really nice. All right, cool. We've got an extremely one megahertz crystal. I don't know if you ever see that. Yeah, lots of decimal points on that. I don't believe them, but sure. Yeah, cool. Excellent. I oh, will put that in the pile of stuff that can go on a little bit later. I and... haven't actually validated things, but based on reading data sheets, the CPU is good up to about 14 megahertz. Okay. Um, my my memory decode logic's probably only good up to like four or five megahertz. Okay. Um, so yeah, at some point I might put a faster crystal on one of my boards and see what happens. That would be interesting to find out what the, where the limits are. Um, all right, so that just leaves us with the chips. So we'll get those out. Uh, it's it's also extremely comforting to have these enormous dip chips. I don't know what it is, but it, it's a very uh, friendly and nostalgic experience to have these big 28-pin uh, you know, through-hole dips. Yeah. All right, let's see what we got. Okay, these ones I'm particularly interested in because that's the Western Design Center logo, which um, you don't see that much if you're mainly dealing with kind of older computers. But um, I'm guessing these are the, yeah, 6522. These are the support chips, there's a 6502, okay, so there's our CPU, 6502, and then and the 6522s give you, give you all the I.O. Right. Um, the board has laid out that one of the, one of the I.O. chips is basically driving the screen and keyboard, or the display keyboard, and the other I.O. chip is completely unused, so you can use it for, like, um, experiments and or mucking around with, oh, cool. um, so yeah, you get um, 16 pins of programmable I.O. aside from the 
input output. Excellent, excellent. And I think there's a few other chips in the kind of like 6502 support chip family, right? There's like um Yeah, there's a um there's a one that does serial, I can't remember yeah. offhand what it is. I think it's like a six five twenty one or something that yeah. gives you um you out serial. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, cool, cool. So we've got a load of 8-bit shift registers. I guess these would be for holding the display state. That's the stuff, yep. Um, what are they, 74 HCD 595s? Yeah. So yeah, the entire display is you just twiddle all the bits out on a, on a um, essentially you treat it like an SPI bus. You set the data, you twiddle the clock, repeat, and you can set the display to be anything you need. Cool, easy, super simple, very friendly. And we've got a 28C256, so that'll be the programmable ROM, which Derek has kindly given me the source code for, and building will be an adventure for a later stream. Be very careful with that. They cost a fortune at the moment because yeah, of supply chain. True. You basically cannot buy them anywhere without spending hundreds of dollars, which is Ooh. ridiculous. Okay, well, I have a few of these in stock as well, so... Yeah, I've got a whole bunch of too, but, like, if you, if you try and lock them up online... All these websites are doing like supply and demand pricing, which is ridiculous. So you find these sites offering them at five hundred US dollars. Right. Oh man. Yeah. Imagine being like, you know, you've got like an X-ray machine or something that needs one of these, and you're like, well, what are we going to do, right? Yep. Cool. A little bit more seven four logic. Seven four. Yep. So that's the glue logic that does um, essentially the address bus memory decode magic to light up the right chip based on the address bus. Very good. And then I don't recognize what this one is. It's a 62256. What's that one? Oh, that would uh, be 30, RAM. 30, 32K RAM. Yeah, great. Interesting. What, uh, what what logo is that? I don't recognize that, that chip company. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head yet. Um, anyone in the chat recognize that logo? See if I can get a... An in focus view on it, probably not. Anyway, that's the chip selection. Get those out of the way. Back in the box and some washers. Very good. Board time. I'm wondering. I'm wondering. Do we start with the? Do we start with the computer or do we start with the display board? We have a look at the instructions. If you start with the compute board, you can actually get it to the point of just having a blinking LED without having to build any of the display board, which can be quite nice because you can validate that your CPU, RAM, ROM, memory decoder, clock, etc., is all valid before you start having to, like, you can prove that your compute is valid before you start building your display board. Because if you're trying to be debug the display and you don't even know if your computer's mm. working, that gets painful. Okay, yeah, you've convinced me that that's probably the <laughs> the best way to do this. So, or I could just say something about read the book and follow the instructions. Because you know, <laughs> ridiculous, ridiculous. We're not here to follow instructions. Well, I probably will be following the instructions. I do believe I do believe there's one part that you haven't I haven't seen you wave around yet. And that's the SD card. Aha, good. Yes, almost forgot that one. So yes, SD breakout. Tell us about that one, Derek. Um, so it turns out you can treat an SD card as a low-speed thing on an SPI bus. Adafruit gives you a little board that does the 5 volt to 3.3 volt level shift magic. Um, so the compute board has a uh, spot for header pins so you can hook up SD card. Um, and in the main ROM that's available on GitHub, I've written a primitive but works um, FAT32 file system implementation that at the moment is read-only, but it means you can then, once you've got it all built, you can write, uh, it goes on the other side, but that's all good. Fancy. Yeah, it goes on the, it goes on the top side. Right, right, right. Um, there's a mistake. I could have let you find out the hard way. Um, <laughs> So yeah, you can you can write code, put it on the SD card, slip it into the uh, into the compute board, and then when you power it up, it runs your code. Rather than having to reflash the ROM every half an hour, it makes the development cycle a whole bunch quicker. Cool, 
Cool. And um, I'm be soliciting suggestions for programs that um, we should write for this because I think we should do a little. We can do a little six five zero two programming stream once we get the machine up and running. Now, according to the instructions and also according to my intuition on building kits, we should start with the lowest profile passive. So, we'll start with the resistors. And I'm realizing that I don't know where my resistor lead forming for this one. But wait, we're all good. So, what have we got? R49 and R52. So there's R52, R49. Cool, those are going to be 1K resistors according to the instructions. You haven't given me 1K resistors, I think. Should these be 10K resistors, Derek? No, those should be 1K resistors. Okay, we've got 10K resistors. Well, I really? want short some resistors, maybe. Yeah, that's what it says they are on the on the on the packaging. Shit. <laughs> that's all right. I'd be very surprised if I don't have some 1K resistors somewhere in my office. All right. Technical difficulties. Stand by. And that the value is not super critical, so as long as you've got something in the ballpark, it'll probably work. Yeah. Um, we might even might even get away with 10k, uh, maybe. What's the... uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty much all just pull up and pull down kind of stuff. Yeah, okay. Well, let's split the difference. I'll find something that's somewhere between 1 and 10k in my stash. Just in case. Let's see what's what's easy to hand. Alright, just dive into this bin for a second. Some of these are labelled, which really saves a lot of time. What's that? 3K? Yeah, we could maybe do a 3K if we had to. What else we got? 4.6. As per expectations, of course, there'll be no 1Ks because they're so common that they get used up immediately and no amount of them can keep, you know, no amount that I buy means that I can keep them in stock, but. Right, let's just do a 3K because it's probably close enough. And I think if you, as you say, yep. if it's going to be a, a pull up resistor, then 3K will be just fine. Get those 10Ks out of the way. Back in the bag with you. What do we got? 3K3. Good enough. So, measure this up. What do we say? Probably that notch. This is the thing I was talking about that uh, perfectly forms the resistor leads. Makes things a lot easier. Yeah, I always just bend them with my fingers like an animal. And it works, but that little bendy jig of yours looks really cool. It's really nice if you're doing heaps uh, and you want them to be consistent. So. And you will be doing heaps on the display board because that's, you know, 48 resistors. Yeah. We'll try and get these all lined up so that the tolerance bands are the same way around, reading left to right as well, just because yep. I like to be... I tend to put tolerance on the right just so you can read them normally when yeah. you board but yeah exactly no left to right top to bottom is usually what i do for yep do for that if you want one of these um this is just a 3d printed thing and the file's available online nice cool so we've got r50 and r51 I'm going to read ahead in the instructions. Do we need to install anything in R50 and R51? Um, 50 and 51 you will install much later, but you could do now, I guess. I'm going to do them now, to heck with these instructions. I like to get all of the resistors out of the way. Oh, what a cowboy. Uh, <laughs> 
I'm a big fan of getting all of the components that are the same height done at the same time. Sure. Um, so yeah, 50 and 51 are also um, pull up, pull down stuff. So I'm interested, Derek, what's the slowest clock rate that you've clocked one of these boards at? Because that's a thing that's a thing that I've always it's very important to me, and I will probably bodge onto this later as a single step clock. I think that's the thing that, that really fascinates me about these single board computers is being able to actually clock them by hand. Um, in theory they can it can be clocked by hand. I've never gone down that path. I just run it at one meg and it works. Mm. But in the design, um in the design, you'll actually see the crystal output go straight into a jumper. Yes. Um, mark clock up on the top. So if you pull off that jumper, you can inject a clock of whatever you want from wherever you want. Um, the classic Ben Eater is you use a um, triple five through a, like an inverter gate to get you a clean square wave, and he drives it from a um, five by five down to as slow as you want because. The Western Design, Western Design 6502 has static registers, so you can clock it all the way down to zero. Yeah, that's a thing that, I don't know, it's like anachronistic, but I still want to do it. So um, yep. that's yep. probably going to yep. be a, it'll be a the, the, the original The original MOS 6502, you couldn't take down below a couple of, couple of hundred kilohertz before the registers got lost. Um, because they, they, they need the refresh. But yeah, um, with static registers and CMOS, they, you, you can clock all the way down to zero and it's perfectly happy. Yeah, so funnily enough, I've been trying to, I've been interested in building a, an 8-bit um, kind of Kim 1 style board like this for so long. And when I was initially speaking out what I kind of wanted to do, um, uh, I actually picked the Z80 CPU specifically because at the time it was harder to get the static 6502s and I was like I'm not building a not going to build a machine if I can't hand clock it um, and yep. so being able to hand clock a 6502 is kind of a neat sort of uh, compromise yes yep. I agree XSS Fox you absolutely should make one of these things uh, it was such a like YOLO Spur of the moment print that I did a few years ago, but it's um, it's become extremely valuable. Particularly if you're doing like keyboard builds and you've got to bend like a hundred and whatever diodes or a hundred and something, you know, through hole guys, it's really useful. Okay. Resistors done. Strangely small number of resistors for a, a board like this, but appreciated. Oh, I need to get my lead box. Nice. Temptation is always to do the bold port solder blobs, but um, maybe we'll come back to that. Are you familiar with the bold port solder blob system, Derek? No. Basically, what you do is, once you've clipped the lead, you come back and flow a little bit of solder over it so it leaves a little smooth and aesthetically pleasing blob instead of the uh the clip Got it. all right Go a little more time consuming but it would look very very tidy it's very nice and tactile if you're playing with the board which i guess you are doing in a lot of uh board port kits all right we've got resistors in let's see what the instructions say that we need to do next Okay, 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 okay. Instructions say to do the reset switch next. I reckon, let's see. Where is the reset switch? Uh, 
Here's the reset switch. Cool. I reckon I am again going to ignore the instructions and I'm going to do the capacitors next. Fair enough. Because I think they're slightly shorter than the reset switch. I've found that the capacitors that I've got don't actually fit the footprint really tidy. The the footprint, the holes need to oh, be a little yeah. closer together. I see. Um, yeah. But you can just sort of bend the legs around and make it work. Yeah, cool. C9 has a little plus on the board, so I'm guessing that's going to be the tantalum. It is. Good. All right. So let's start filling in capacitors. So for those following along at home, um, most of the capacitors, my first boards didn't even have them and the system still works. The idea of those capacitors is they just um, uh, like filter capacitors for the supply rail of each chip as the chip transitions, as it does like internal gate transitions high and low, it may need to draw more current briefly than the main supply can handle. Um, and it puts weird transients on the on the supply line, or at least that's my understanding of things. Um, and as I say, I, I had a perfectly good working, like version two or version three ran perfectly without capacitors. But then the internet kept telling me that if you don't add capacitors, you will die in hell. Um, so I added capacitors to the, to the designs um, for the last few board revisions, and it's also perfectly good. Very good. I guess you would call these decoupling capacitors, would you? Yeah, I think that was the fancy phrase that I've heard. But again, I'm not, I never really got qualified in electronics. I don't know what I'm doing. I just stick things together and it works. Fair enough. You and me both, buddy. All right. Interesting comment there of um, turning the supply line into an RF transmitter. Some of the really early experimental computers, um, people actually wrote code that would manipulate the, the, the buses and the supply line to create music via interference on radios sitting nearby. That's not a bad idea. Um, in the to build on stream pile, which is rapidly taking over my desk, is... Uh, this AliExpress AM radio kit, which oh, yes. is about the sort of size and specs, I think, of the old classic Altair demo AM radio. So maybe that's something we can uh, we can have a go nice. later on as well. Okay, have we got all the capacitors? You're missing one. Da, 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 da. Yes, yes, I am. There's something also very pleasingly nostalgic about these um, nice orange ceramic capacitors on this nice pristine green PCB. Takes me back. Dick Smith, Funway yeah, One, from into the, Electronics. From the whole, um, not sponsored, um, the PCB companies that do all the colours of the rainbow these days, I'm just like, if I'm doing it, they're going to be green. Yeah, very nice. I didn't realize that the uh, bold port solar system was military spec. Um, XSS Fox, is that a real thing? What uh, what what does the military need smooth solder points for? I'm thinking it might also be the if you have tiny little spikes of wire sticking out of your solder, they become RF antennas. Where if you make everything smooth and rounded, you get less RF interference coming off the board. Would right. be my guess. That does make sense, yeah. I read an interesting article a few months ago uh, from someone trying to debunk the idea that uh, like sharp corners and traces could be RF transmitters. I don't know if that's actually a thing or not, but I've definitely seen that in all the documentation says never do never do a ninety degree corner and, and, and board design. Yeah. 
yeah, it's interesting to, to think of whether that might be folk wisdom or whether it's a real thing. I certainly, I'm all for aesthetic PCB layout. Like, you know, don't uh, feel like you've got to make your traces super, super regular or, um, you know, mechanical looking. There's lots of, got a whole board to play with. It can be nice sometimes to just route the traces all over the place or, you know, try and say something or send a message with the PCB design. The thing that's on my to-do list, which I haven't done for a long time, is to um, hand draw some PCBs again at some point, because that's always quite satisfying. I always feel like it imbues the yeah. thing that you're doing with a certain amount of personality that you don't get otherwise. These boards are all just done with the input auto-router, and oh. again, the internet tells me that auto-router is work of the devil, and it will be the end of society as we know it if you use the auto router and i just looked at routing all of that stuff and went hell no um so i pushed the auto router and it just worked so that's what i went with yeah i sort of did the auto route and then tidied up a few of the more obvious places where it could be done nicer but within reason that's just exactly what came out of the auto router yeah fair enough i've used uh the kaikade i don't think kaikade actually has an auto router anymore but back in the day when kaikade had a very basic auto router i've used that for really basic designs just kind of because in some ways you know it's it's nice to have a, a thing laid out by the machine and you can kind of lean into that aesthetic as well uh, which i thought was cool at the time Very good, very good. Looking nice. Starting to look like a thing. Um, I guess we'll throw the tantalum in there as well. So the tantalum um, exists as essentially part of, it's essentially the power on reset. The resistor up in that corner plus the tantalum holds the reset line low until the capacitors come up to charge, which buys um, about a quarter of a second or whatever, because the official spec, se spec sheet says um, you have to hold the reset line low for, I think it's something like 10 or 12 clock cycles. Um, right. So that's where the whole tantalum resistor thing comes in. Um, Ben Eater's original design just has a 0.1 um, capacitor, but that's not enough. So I then took a guess and put in a tantalum and it seemed to work fine. Cool, very good. But then there's a hard reset button right next to it if you want to do that too. Like if you power it up and it doesn't play nice, then just jab the reset button and you're all good. Yeah, it's a nice, simple way of getting the reset pulse done because I know a common way in these... Um kind of 8-bit SBC, 8-bit uh, kind of trainer boards is to use a like single chip reset chip solution as well? Yeah, I did try a single chip reset solution, but my supply voltage wasn't quite, wasn't quite playing nice because they give, they give a low reset all the way until you've got like 4.8 volts on your supply line or something. Right. And I found that just unreliable as hell until I realized that my supply line was like 4.7 volts. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, the, the Commodore 64 used to do it with a triple uh, five timer set up as a one shot, uh, which again, only one more component essentially, but yeah. Depends on how clean you want that reset signal. Sure. Okay. Speaking of, might as well do the reset switch now. I think actually, Derek, your instructions were were accurate because this is slightly shallower than the uh, capacitors, but that's okay because it holds itself in while we solder it. So it does hold itself in. No yes. Drama. Nicely laid out. I assume you've just pulled the footprints for these from. A library in Easy EDA. You didn't have to make any custom footprints or anything for this. 
Uh, no, no custom footprints required. Everything's in the um, in the EDA. Yep. Very nice. There was a bit of back and forth because I dropped in a, a reset switch um, from the catalog of footprints, and then I had to actually find out what component to buy that would fit that footprint, <laughs> um, which is a bit of a fiddle. But everything else was just yeah, easy. Nice. That's nice and tactile. You know what? I feel like we need to bling the reset switch slightly. Do I have, do I have, in my bin of switch stuff, a button or hat that we can put on it? Maybe. What do you reckon? Yeah, nice, nice. I feel like the giant red cube conveys a certain, uh, conveys the uh, the necessary level of seriousness, although it's going to spin around uh, <laughs> in a way that I don't really like, but maybe we won't do that. I thought I had a, some smaller red, red hats for micro switches in my stash, but oh, this might do it actually. Pop that one off. Oops, this might be a little bit more suitable. That will go with the other buttons. There we go. I reckon that's a nice little, nice little upgrade. I've had these, uh, had these micro switch buttons for, I don't know, 20 years. So, got to get through them. Nice. Um, I tried to make a, I tried to make a, a PCB router once, um, XSS Fox, and I was so terrified of. I basically converted an old 3D printer and I was so terrified of um, generating big clouds of PCB dust that I never actually fired it up on a real PCB, which is a bit sad. And then it eventually got turned back into a 3D printer. But one day, it's on my list, I want to make myself a, a CNC PCB router. I think that would be nice. All right, let's see what we got. Chip sockets, yep, I think that makes sense. We can put some chip sockets in. So you've almost definitely got sockets for the 40 pin stuff and the 28 pin stuff for the RAM and the ROM. Yep. But those three little um, jelly bean chips, you, I might not have given you sockets for. That's right. I think we can live without sockets for those. Let's do some sockets. And this is where, oh, don't look at this bit. <laughs> Just bend those out of the way. Temporarily. This is where my hubris comes back to get me for um, wanting to do the caps first. Okay. Just check the notch on the socket to get pin one. Look at that. Beautiful. Okay, probably have to take that off as well to make this work. So traditionally, I would do pin one to the left, and then pin one to the top. Mm -hmm. But that um that one six five two two on the board has pin one at the bottom. Yeah. The vertically aligned six five two two has pin one to the bottom edge of the board. Um, and that's just because it made all of the trace routing so much easier. Yeah. No, that looks that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, I totally think if you want to do it to make a make make routing easier, then you can totally just wild style the chips and put them on there however you like. So, let's tap the pin in the corner of this. And then make sure that it's sitting sort of acceptably. Ah, my button! Other corner. Make sure it's still sitting acceptably. Have you ever done any work with surface mount and um, the, the, the magical heat gun stuff? Oh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. In fact, almost everything I build these days is surface mount. I haven't done a through hole board in quite a while. Okay. 
It's I mean, it's as... partly my eyesight, I guess, but surface mount stuff just scares the hell out of me. It's really not as difficult as you might think. Um, I know it's easy for me to say, but uh, it really is more approachable than I think a lot of people realize. Um, the, you know, you can use a heat gun that you can pick up for a hundred dollars. Will work pretty acceptably. Um, you can get hot plates now for not too much that will will work acceptably. The components are very cheap. Uh, you don't have to drill a PCB, so that aspect of it's quite nice. Yeah, I could totally teach you to surface mount to do surface mount assembly. Okay. I don't think you would struggle too much with it. We will have to consider this. Yeah. I guess as you progress your way through the, the history of computing, building ever newer machines, eventually you'll have to go to surface mount at some point. <laughs> I do love doing these dip sockets. It's very meditative. I notice you're jumping back and forth between the two corners. I tend to tack two corners until I know it's in the right place and then I just do one whole side and the other whole side. Yeah, this is just a bit of superstition that I've developed over the years around um, preventing heat buildup in any particular part of the component as I generally will go um, Yep, that makes sense. back and forth. It helps in two ways. It means that you're not going it, you, you get a bit of kind of like dwell time between each pin for everything to kind of cool down a bit and it also means that you're spreading out the heat that you're adding. Yep. Whether it actually makes a difference, I don't know, but you tend to pick up these kind of superstitions and theory crafting and, and things. Yeah, yeah. And again, if I was soldering the chip directly, I'd be a bit more paranoid. Yeah. That's half the reason that I've done sockets, is if you screw it up thoroughly, you've lost like a 10 cent socket, not a $10 yeah. chip. Yeah, definitely. Especially with the difficulty. Are, are these chips also affected by the supply chain catastrophes that are happening at the moment? The only thing I've found that's really hard to get is the um, EPROM. Um, right. Everything else I've had no trouble with. But yeah, lot, lots of the online sites for the EPROM, they're saying like 88 week um, delivery right. time, which is clearly just broken. Yeah, that's pretty gnarly. But then I also managed to buy about 20 EPROMs at 4 or $5 a piece off eBay. So I've got plenty at the moment. Good, good. Good. The, the uh, Western design stuff for the actual 6502 and 6522s, last I looked, they had like a 2015 manufacture date or something. So I guess they manufacture a whole mess in a batch and then just have them on the shelf and when they sell them all, they'll run another batch. Yeah, makes sense. All right, excellent. First socket's in. If we can get through this whole project without having to use my desoldering machine, then I'll be very pleased. All right, I'm gonna take a very brief break now and put you back onto the loading screen and then we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Awesome. Okay, we're back. Are you still with us, Derek? I am. Excellent. I've had my break banana. We can continue soldering. Um, Derek and I were just... Actually, I, I also stood up and had a stretch, but I didn't get myself another drink. So you just keep going with the show and I'll not be on the audio for a moment. Okay, very good. Derek and I were just talking about the fact that today is daylight savings changeover. And here in Aotearoa, and how much of a pain in the ass that is, because both of us have multiple clocks that are not NTP sync. Um, and I was thinking about a project that I did a while ago, which I should probably write up, which was NTP syncing a Casio F91 W wristwatch um, by having a microcontroller 
repeatedly press the seconds zero button um, and then trying to calibrate the lag between pressing the button and having the seconds flip to zero on the display so that I could press it just in time, wait the, I think it was like 12 microseconds or something for the display to go and have it land on zero at exactly the top of the second. Um, but that, that's the story for another day. So, <laughs> sounds like you're back, Derek. I am, I am. Excellent. Yes, that's how I got my F91W extremely accurately synced to NTP. Yeah. I mean, if you've got a, if you swap out the guts of the F91 for something that's got a full TCP stack and some Wi-Fi, then you're golden, right? I don't know. Somehow that that, that feels worse somehow. <laughs> All right. Ram socket. How's everybody else's day going in the chat? Everybody having a pleasant, a pleasant afternoon? So the original Ben Eater design gets you 16k of RAM just because of the way he does his memory map um, whereas I've changed the memory map to get you 32k of RAM um, and at some point I'm thinking I should be able to fiddle with the memory map to get the RAM up to maybe even 48k of usable RAM which right. would be quite nice because you've got 64k of 64k bytes of address space to play with right yes yeah so how does that compare to, say, the Commodore 64 memory map? So Commodore 64, again, technically 64K addressing, but they did creative things with banking, ROM, in and out, so you could change the memory map on the fly. Um, if, you wanted, uh, if you wanted lots of RAM, you could map out the basic ROM or you could map out the character ROM and bring RAM into that space. So a lot of the cartridge games would... Um, map everything out because they had all the code in the cartridge so they'd map out all the basic ROM and have more RAM available. Right. So officially on the board it was, there was 64K of RAM. You just couldn't access it all at once. You could get pretty close by turning off a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of ROM but you needed a chunk. You needed about 8 or I think it was about 8K just for the display buffer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering about that because you've got. I know the um, C sixty four. You you lean pretty heavily on sprites, but you've still got a. I think it's like a low res screen. Yes, yeah, so there's something. a low res bitmap and a high res bitmap, and uh, um, just the spread out like text character buffer as well. Yeah. <clears throat> a large chunk of the graphics in any of the games was, um, you know, a bitmap for the background, and then everything else was sprites. Yeah. Do you have particular favourite Commodore 64 software or Commodore 64 game? Uh, I was a big fan of playing R-Type on the Commodore 64 back in the day. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that was that was pretty good. And there was another one called, I think it was called Paradroid, um, where you would run around, run, run around taking over robots and blowing things up. That was kind of cool. Um... I dabbled in the probably early 90s. I dabbled with um, demo coding on the Commodore 64. Oh, yeah. ne never actually, you know, never actually released anything, but I wrote stuff that worked okay. That's cool. And there were a stunning amount of tricks you could do to push the limits of a Commodore 64 through creative software. Yeah, it's pretty mind bending. Actually, when um, we're done with the stream, I should talk to you. I'm catching up with a friend of mine tomorrow who is. Um, uh, interested in getting into some more C64 demo scene kind of stuff, so we should have a chat about that later. Nice, nice. That's the wrong socket. Is this is the it? wrong socket? Oh, that's supposed to be your low-profile ZIF going in there. You are absolutely correct. That was a good catch. Thank you, Derek. All right, let's um, let's get the 6522 socket in first. Yeah, you don't want to end up like me 
doing that um that that ROM booter game that I did for the badge challenge a few years ago and having to pull it in and out of the regular socket so many times that I was worried that I was only going to get a couple more insertions out of the socket. Um, yep. And desperately trying the night before the, the thing to get it all buttoned up. No, I'm excited to use that, that Ziff socket. It seems quite nice. And it's interesting that it's got a... The mechanism is rotated 90 degrees because a normal Ziff socket, it slides a thing lengthwise to grip the chip. But I noticed in that one, it's kind of sliding it Side to side, if yep. that makes sense. That's kind yep. of neat. <clears throat> Do you know if that sort of socket has a special name or anything like no that? No idea. Yeah, it's neat. I don't even know where I found that low profile Ziff. I think I just did like on one of the parts sites. I just searched for 28 pin Ziff and went, oh, a low profile. Let's have that. Yeah. Cool. It seems like it maybe wouldn't be quite as robust as um, the big ones, but. It does feel a bit crunchy the first time I moved the little lever. It's mm. like, is this going to work? Is this going to break? Um, but, you know, one of my development boards here, the, the chip's been in and out dozens of times, and it's still flawless. Cool. Early on in my thinking about building a 6502 machine, I was um, planning on doing, like, the classic UV erasable yeah. prom. And that just seemed like a really cool idea because, again, you know, 1970s style. And now I've seen, like, this, the, the, the length of my development cycle. There is no way I could do this with a UV erasable. Yeah, you, can, um, you, you definitely get a feel for why, um, you know, folks wanted to use ROM emulators back in the day, right? Yeah, I mean, a, a, lot, a lot of modern design decisions, you go, oh, it's like that because, you like, by building a kit like this, you realize yeah. why some of the modern design decisions have gone the way they have. Because, yeah, when I'm, when I'm changing ROM code and I can make a change to the code, recompile it, pull out the ROM, flash the ROM, put it back in, in about two minutes versus a half-hour UV erase cycle, it, there's, there's just no comparison. Otherwise, I'd end up with like a dozen UV erasable chips and be erasing a whole batch overnight yeah. so I could do development the next day or something, which is even more ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, um, it definitely makes a difference having a erasable chip. So the chip that we've got there, is that technically that's an EE prom? I yeah, yeah, correct. Ele electrically erasable. So you just um, slap at the ROM programmer and pull the lever and it takes care of wiping it and reprogramming it all nice. in one hit. Very good. Because I have used uh, Flash versions of those um, 2.5 series ROMs in the past. Which I, is that the same? I guess it's the same thing. I guess it's I think under the hood there's something slightly different, but functionally mm. they're pretty much identical. Because I just remember in the late 90s looking at proms that I was going to use to build my kind of design board thing for this. And I had a similar kind of thought about, oh, I'm going to have to get an EEPROM eraser and yep. all of this other nightmare stuff. In fact, I um, should show you because I've got it sitting right here. I found the other day the original ROM programmer that I actually bought for the purposes of making my own... Um, nice. Board like this in, in about 1998 or 1999. Um, and yeah, it yep. uh, connects over the parallel port and you run it from DOS. I remember, I remember dabbling with um, AVR microcontrollers in probably 99, 2000 time frame. And the first, the first thing you do, did would had was solder together the kit for programming it. Yep. <clears throat> Yeah, I remember looking at, I don't know if you ever saw, um, at the time there was um, a guy's webpage that had a design for a, a, a one-part PIC programmer where the only component that you needed was a 100-watt light bulb. Did you ever see that? No, but that leaves me with an awful lot of questions. Yeah. So, Ziff socket, this way around? Oh, uh, technically you can put it either way. I tend to do the handle on the right, mm. but it should fit either way. 
I, I find the handle on the right means it doesn't get in the way of that capacitor. I think I'm going to do it this way around, just because then the handle is near pin 1, which is kind of more what I'm used to on the programmer. I feel yeah, like that is gonna, more traditional, yes. That's going to yeah. prevent me from making from making errors here. So Yes, which to be fair, I have made that mistake myself many a time. Mm. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so the, the, the single part pick programmer, would you, would you care to hazard a guess as to how that works? I mean, if all you've got is a light bulb, you get a variation in resistance as the light goes on and off or something. But other than that, I have no idea. You're sort of on the right track there. So the, the operating principle for the um, this, this single part um, pick programmer is basically you wire the pick I.O. pins straight up to... Now, how does this work? I think you wire the pick I.O. pins straight up to an RS232 serial port, and then you wire the 100 watt light bulb in the ground line to the chip to act as a current limiter. Right. And then you get the RS232 voltage, which is like often like 12-ish volts on a um, on an old uh, old PC, and that's enough to that that gives you the programming voltage for the pick, and then it's just current limited to stop it from blowing up. Sure. <laughs> I don't know if this is a thing that anyone ever actually built. I see XSS Fox is saying OMG yes in the chat, so maybe she has some idea about <laughs> about this. But um, yeah, it just it was a thing that I was always like. One day I'm going to end up building one of these. I can just feel it. I'm going to be stuck somewhere and I'm going to need to program a pick and I'm going to have to like unscrew a light bulb from a ceiling. But we've sort of lost RS-232 ports, um, which I guess would complicate things. It's, it's harder to find an RS-232 port. Well, it's hard to find a 100 watt resistive light bulb at this point, probably. Yeah, I, I mean... Back to sort of Commodore 64 and demo coding, I'll, I, I find a lot of this is interesting from the how do you push the hardware to its limits and how do you do things that the original designers never thought about or never, yeah. you know, a, a lot of let's ignore the design sheet and see what actually works. I find really, really interesting. Speaking of things that are hard to come by, um... I'm down to one loop left on my solder spool, so we're going to have to have a ceremonial spool change in the middle of this video, which I think this... I've had this spool on here for about 10 years, and we're, we're almost there. Wow. I really hope that the replacement spool I got is not garbage solder, actually, because I haven't... Uh, didn't, didn't unpack it and try it yet. Although this was just... I was going to ask, do you have a... Lead versus lead free port. This is leaded solder that I'm using today, um, which I have used for a long time, and I think it's a complicated problem because um, you could. There's an argument to be made. I think that a hobbyist usage of leaded solder is not overall that bad. Um, it's not the kind of you know. The, the, the big push to lead-free lead solder, I think, was more of a kind of, like, stop cumulative huge amounts of lead getting into the environment, which is, you know, a thing that we really ought to be doing. But um, it's less clear whether it's, like, a huge deal for, for hobbyists. But having said all of that, I've tried a few of the new, more newer lead-free alloys and found them to be actually pretty good, which really leaves not much justification for using leaded solder, I think, as a hobbyist. Like, yeah, I know, I know. I know. Certainly 10 years ago, people were saying lead-free solder is garbage and it's hard to work with and mm. the, the, it doesn't flow nicely. But I think the modern lead-free stuff is quite reasonable. Yeah, I haven't used it enough to really be confident about it, but, um, yeah, I, I feel like it's... Well, I mean, I say, I say that I'm pretty sure my current spooler is leaded solder, I yeah. think. All right, so... Time to open the Juratech brand solder wire, which, given that the one that I've had on there for 10 years, I think doesn't even have a brand on it. 
Oh no, it's your take as well, so hopefully this is going to be more or less the same. Certainly not a premium solder brand as far as I know, but it's done me all right. Oh no, you get to watch me struggle with this solder spool. All right. There it is. The end of the spool. There's the evolution in Duratec solder spool branding over the last 10 years. Mm, some sticky stuff on there. On the topic of um, pushing hardware past its limits, did you see um, Ben Hack did a video a while back of using a AT Tiny Ten, like those the yes. tiny little grain of salt um, microcontrollers with only like whatever five wires. Yes. And he built he built an entire um, uh, like Space Invaders out of it. Yes, I enjoyed that. It's, um, Again, with the pushing the limits of the hardware, you know, when you're simulating simulating a, um, a video signal just by bit twiddling at the right speed from inside the microcontroller to get you your one bit out is absolutely bonkers. Yeah, no, it was really cool. I, um, I've been meaning to go and get some of those AT Tiny Tens, although I bet they're also completely unavailable. But Well, yes. <laughs> The um, AT Tiny 85 has been a perennial favourite of mine. Um, for a long time, we used those a lot for KiwiCon kind of props and things. Right. All right. Looking good. What do you reckon, Derek? So far, so good. So far, so good. Yeah. Excellent. So next up on the list is the crystal well you could probably do some more chips and sockets um do we have all, all the crystal all the crystal yeah let's see let me just see what's in the pile did i uh, did i miss a socket did we ever conclude whether or not we had the right number of sockets i don't remember I don't know if we got to that. So you can still do this a 40 pin for that other IO chip and you've got your Jelly Bean Blue Logic, which either you've got sockets for, you can just do chips directly on the board. Yeah. It appears I've given you an extra 28 pin socket that you don't need. Yeah, and I think we're short a 40 pin socket. Right. I might have one in my stash. Let's have a look. Yeah, when I was putting together your box of bits, I was a little short on sockets. That's okay. I don't think we have a socket, but... Um, let's not worry about it for now. And we'll just move on. Yeah. Cats are just a little dangerous way on the of the board. We do, so, have, yeah. we do have my much-loved desoldering station, if, uh, if that's what uh, we have to do, so... Um, I think I do probably have a 40 pin socket somewhere in the house. It'll just be a matter of digging it out. My drawer of sockets does not seem to have any IC sockets in it, which is a bit suspicious. In fact, maybe there's something somewhere else in this. Not sure. All right, we'll just proceed and maybe we do just solder the chip straight down to the board. So, crystal, dot matches dot. Sure, why not? Goes in. All right, let's see if 10 years worth of evolution has had any impact on the quality of Duratex solder.
Right. Oh, it's got a different smelling flux. That's not a good sign. This smells more like um, more like an older flux actually. Got a kind of more rosiny smell to it. I don't know what to make of that. It appears to solder fine though, so we're good. Actually, do I want to put this in a socket? But like now. No, no, it's never too late. It's fine. <laughs> Maybe I do want to put this in a socket. Yeah, well, it would give you the option of chucking in a 2 mega hit crystal yeah. at some point. Let's look and see if I've got a socket for that before we get too excited. All of my boards, I just put the crystal straight on the board because I just don't care. But yeah, I have seen them. Um, I have seen the, the idea of using sockets for the crystal so you can go faster at some point in the future. For some reason I've got all these dip switches in my socket spin. Have you got, I can't remember the correct name for it, like those strips of like edge connector socket stuff that you can make? Yes. Arbitrary sized sockets. Yes, I've got a lot of pin headers, so that's another option. Um, I wonder. I wonder. Can I do that? No, that's slightly too wide. Maybe we chop one of these. It's almost perfect. Ah, to hell with it. We can do a different crystal externally, it's fine. That's true, that's why that clock jumper is there for, mm -hmm. is if you pull off the clock jumper then you're isolating the crystal and you can feed in whatever you want. out of the way. Right. The watch nerd in me wonders what kind of watch you're wearing today. I saw something come in shot there briefly. Uh, this is a Seiko Alpinus. I don't know. Make what you will of that. Nice. Okay. Install the jumpers. So the, the one jumper is just for the clock, which is a jumper. The other one is for power. Yep. Some of my early boards, I just did a standard vertical header for power, but I've actually found I've given you a big strip of 90 degree headers. So if you just cut off two off the end of that big long strip um, for the power, you can put the power in oh, yeah. from an angle, which is kind of more convenient. Yep. Good. I'll yeah, that. that just cut two off that and use mm -hmm. that for your power. All right, good, we'll do that. Oh, I got three, close enough. <laughs> I always, it's always nice to cut, just pop these with the hand if I can. So. Close enough. Cool, like that, you reckon? Yeah. That looks pretty good, I think. Beautiful. Except. I'm surprised we didn't have to do this already, actually. I appreciate the enormous, obvious pin labeling on the back of the board with the uh, power and ground as well. Well, I have bad eyesight, and it would really, and I, I have got it wrong more than once. So why isn't this going? And the answer is, well, all the chips are getting really hot. Yeah. That's the other thing I quite like about this 
sort of early mid seventies tech is it's actually pretty resilient to doing dumb shit. Right. Um, you know, put the power on backwards for two or three minutes and yeah, everything gets stonking hot, but once it calms down, it still works. Let's go. Cool. I should have put this on first because then we can get it nice and lined up. And as for getting power onto the board, that is very much an exercise left to the reader. Yeah. Um, I've got a, courtesy of Adafruit, I've got a USB cable that just gives you, like, um, pins that come off the end that you can just put straight onto that header. But I'm sure you've got, like, a desktop power supply or something that you can inject 5 volts onto those pins. Yeah, we can, we can work that out. 5 volts is available. I'm going to be slightly tedious about this. Make that a bit smoother. All right, good. It's done. There is something to be said for quality hand handiwork. You know, if you're going to do it, do it properly. Make it tidy. Yeah. I reckon I'll the top to these as well then while we're in here. Nice. All right, clock here. And we'll again put this on, because I have experienced many times with these header pins, overheating them slightly and having them melt out of the um, yep. little plastic strips up there. Yep. Yep. No, I I absolutely put the jumper on top when I solder them so they don't get away from themselves. This lined up. Good. All right. Is that it for jumpers? Uh, at this point, yes, I believe so. Excellent. Eight pin headers for the SD card board. All right. So the logic here is you put on the eight pin header for the SD card board, but you don't put on the SD card board. Yeah. And that gives you nice headers to do like a test blink LED sort of a thing. Nice. Okay. That makes sense. Very good. So I'm guessing we want to do something like that. That doesn't want to go in the hole. It's a pretty tight fit. It does go if you give it a bit of a push. I think this again is where the um the footprints from the internet actually could be like 0.1 bigger holes to make that mm. better fit nicely. Yes, these are slightly too small, aren't they? Alright. I, I I found if you just kind of lean on it a bit, it does go in, but it is a very tight fit. And press them all in simultaneously. There we go. Oh, that was very satisfying when it did go in there. Almost feel like we don't need to solder that. That will probably <laughs> just, that will probably yep. just function. But I will solder it. Right, that's definitely the correct way to do that. I'm going to take your silence as a yes. Uh, it is, it is. I really should probably make sure that the, like, in the next board revision, make the silk screen on the other side of the board, because at the moment the silk screen's on the wrong side of the board. Yeah. Which could confuse people to install the entire SD card on the wrong side of the board. Yeah, I could see myself doing that. In fact, you might want to change the pad type on these to be uh, more like the IC pads, so there's a little bit more kind of... Um, 
make the ring like whole context as to like a, 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 a whole layout that shows where the SD card sits rather than just the headers. Mm, that would be nice. Yeah, no, that, that, could, that could be done. I can look into that. I'm not sure where my solar brick is. Oh, it was right out of frame and all the been soldering things. I mean, you will notice that the boards are actually marked as like version 0 0.99 engineering edition. Yeah. Right. Engineering sample. Um, I think I think like software hardware wise, it's pretty well nailed down as just the finer points of um, assembly and silk screen and odds and ends like that could could do with a little bit more tweaking. Imagine if we never invented soldering and electronics, everything was friction fit. Yeah, uh, the comment there, uh, Lego, you know. Yeah. Well, that sounds nice to me. There is. I mean, breadboard sort of went down that path a little bit, but it's just so flaky and unreliable for a big project. Like, if you're doing, you know, uh, uh, one or two chips and a couple of LEDs, fine. But as soon as you get into this kind of stuff, um, hundreds of wires on a breadboard trying to fall, find that just as you head in. So I do have this interesting thing, which is a pocket chip, um, RIP, but the headers up here, they used a thing that I think Adafruit came up with, where, I'm not sure if you can see it in the video, but they stagger the pins up and down just enough that um, if you push a standard, yep. uh, like, header pin, it becomes friction fit. Strip into it, yeah. It's um, it kind of friction grabs it nicely. This is that's the wrong, wrong, the wrong thing. But um, yeah, I always thought that was a neat trick, and it was cool to see it on a kind of uh, semi-production yeah, no, thing. I've, I've got one of those pocket chips in a in a in a, in a drawer somewhere. Actually, I think I've got two or three of them because you know it seemed like a cool idea, and then they stopped doing software for them. So meh. yeah, it's a bit unfortunate. So. The do I have it here? I don't have it there, but um, <clears throat> the Linux upstream Linux kernel actually supports all of the hardware on the the chip now, with the exception of the flash IC. So I have one sitting around here somewhere, and I've got a a flash chip with the same footprint that is supported. So at some point, I'm going to hot air the flash chip off and make a pocket chip that actually runs upstream Linux. Um, you, l you let me know if you get that working and I'd be really keen to like, yeah, that would be very cool. Yeah, it seemed like the path of least resistance rather than having to make the chip work was to just put a chip on that works already. Okay, so we're at, we've got the header pins in there. Yeah, there's definitely something a little bit wonky about that footprint. It's very um, like it doesn't have much kind of like pad around the the thing after they've drilled the hole either. Right. Okay. okay. I'm sure that'll still work. All right. Do not install the SD card board. Insert the chips. Well, you're still missing your glue logic, which either you're going to find sockets for or solder directly to the board. I reckon we just solder it. Glue logic. Very conveniently labelled on the board what the um, what each part needs to be. I love these IC tubes. I've been hoarding them my whole life. I don't know why. I never use them for anything, but I've got tons of them. I've got a few of them, but I don't know where you can buy like empty tubes from. All right, we have to do a classic little manoeuvre here and get the pin straightened out. Yep. I believe some people have an actual like little gadget for squashing the pins. I just kind of wing it. Yeah, I have one somewhere, but I've virtually never used it. I don't find it actually works as well as just crushing them against the table because at least the one I have, which is just a real cheapy one, it doesn't squeeze them past the, the point far enough and then they just spring back to... Yep. Yeah, whereas if you do them against the table, you kind of 
Right, because we're putting these in here permanently, we're going to double check that that's the S74HC00, <laughs> which it does. So do you want to explain the how these how these chips work? What are the three chips we've got here, Derek? Uh, so we have got the uh, the seven four zero zero is a quad NAND, a quad NAND, and the other one there is the seven four zero two is a quad NOR. And between the two of those, we're doing some memory decode logic, which gets us the bottom thirty two k lights up RAM, the top. 16k lights up ROM and the 16k in the middle um, gives you an IO line and then the other parts of the address bus you can just tie directly to your IO chips. It's kind of hard to explain verbally but the idea is that the there's a 16k block that allows you to put an assortment of IO chips in there and it's just really really badly laid out from a memory map kind of point of view but it's stunningly easy because you don't need many support chips. Right. I've looked at doing a better memory map, but suddenly you start needing a um, like a program gate array for your memory decode. Yeah. Which you... is something, which is something to consider. But this allows you to do it with like two jelly bean chips. Yeah, you need a kind of pattern matching capability beyond a certain level of sophistication, right? Exactly. Can you, do you need to, be able um, to hold some state in there as well, or, or can you do that state? Uh, no, you, you don't necessarily need to hold state, but if you do it with, as much as you could do it with 74 logic, you end up like four or five gates deep, and the propagation delay is so long that you can't get above a couple of hundred kilohertz. Right. Whereas if you do it with a program array, if you do it with like a, 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 a gal or um, gal pal kind of a gate array, um, you can get really, really fast. Uh, propagation while still having a fairly complex uh, memory decode map. And the, th the third jelly bean that I think um, you haven't dealt with yet or you might be dealing with now, the, um, uh, the 7421, um, that's uh, just a four input AND which I'm using on the IRQ lines so that you can get IRQs off either of the IO chips. Because the Ben Ether design has only one of the 6522 IO chips, right. and he brings that straight up to the IIQ line, which is great. I want to be able to pull IIQs off either of my IO chips, so I just need an AND in there. Right. How do you tell which one triggered the IIQ? You just have to check both, is that the...? Uh, you check both. At the moment, any code I'm doing that uses IIQs, I do it the lazy way of I know which chip was likely to have done the IIQ, so I just deal with it right um but yeah in theory there's a register in the 6522 that says whether it raised an iq or not so you you can just go and pull the two chips and figure out which one's guilty right <clears throat> xss fox in the chat says uh has mentioned wire wrap which i think is very interesting i um have a whole oh that didn't work that didn't go well i have a whole set of uh wire wrap tools and boards and sockets and things because that was another incomplete attempt at building a thing similar to this because I was going to try and wire wrap one. So that's definitely no. on the, the to-do list. I don't yeah, and I mean, that was another that. attempt at let's not solder things. And mm. I think it was actually very successful in certain circumstances because, you know, all, all of your pins had a sharp square edge and when you wrap around it three or four times, you get a really tight binding. Um, I think it was a lot more on the prototyping than finished product kind of territory, mm. but yeah, I've never really played with wire wrap. Yeah, 
<clears throat> at least a few years ago when I was acquiring my wire wrap stuff, it was a little bit hard to get the the tools and sockets and everything now. Yeah. Actually, that's a good point. I've probably got I've probably got a forty pin socket in that bag. Well, we'll have a look at that in a sec and see if I've got a socket in there. Nice. Cure. That one didn't even need to be bent. Excellent. Easy mode. Yeah, it is frustrating that some of the older electronics is getting harder and harder to get, like, as you say, the wire wrap stuff. Um, again, we, we were discussing this um, before, the, uh, before the stream started. I was discussing how hard it is to just buy an ADSL router these days. I was helping a friend out yesterday with where do we buy an ADSL router? And because everyone's gone private, you just can't buy them, which is ridiculous. Um, but yeah, as, as, as tech, be it wire wrap or uh, 6502 or Z80, unless there's a market for it, it goes away. Mm. So I think uh, to some extent, hobbyists still building machines like this keeps that supply chain of people still warm. Yeah, I heard years and years and years ago that <clears throat> well, I heard it said about various chips. I've heard people say that the Z80 was the, the most manufactured CPU of all time. But I've also heard people say the same thing about the 8051. And, and I've heard the same thing said about the 6502. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. I, yeah. Think, I think the 8051 is probably, like, from a code compatible, it's baked into everything. If someone's, like, bought uh, the rights to, to, to the core and they've mm. baked it into all manner of crap, Whereas actual 6502s, I think they manufactured a crap load of 40 pin through hole 6502s that are all the same. Um, Z80 is a little bit the same. There's lots of embedded stuff where it's a yeah. modern, modern like surface mount chip, but it's 650, uh, Z80 compatible or it's a Z80 software core on the inside yeah. with all of its flash and its ROM and its IO, but it's a Z80 <clears throat> in the middle of it all. Yeah, and you certainly get like a. 8051 that's got USB, you know, just as... as yeah, exactly, as well. exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. All right, that's that done. So, <clears throat> time to dive in to the drawer that probably has the wire wrapping stuff and a bunch of sockets in it. Maybe. It wasn't that drawer. It was also not that drawer. a good theory but I don't actually know where the bag of wire wrapping stuff is either which probably means it's in a really inaccessible place under the desk so I'm wondering if maybe we call it here sorry to, to end on such a cliffhanger um, but um, or whether you want to do have you just got header pins that you can get that last yeah, triple maybe let's have a because at this dig. point you are like a cup a, one chip and a little bit of Blur and you, you'll get to the blinking LED stage, which would be quite a nice spot to finish if going. We built a computer that can blink a little light. It would be nice. It would be nice. Maybe we just solder the chip straight in there. Maybe we just do that. I can't always I pull believe, the... I believe there was a bit of a YOLO attitude in the chat earlier. <laughs> All right, can we get a vote in the chat? What do you think we should do? Should we try and, should we try and push on? Actually, oh, here's a bag of sockets. Here's a bag of sockets. Maybe there's something in here that will work. No. All right, what do you reckon? I think maybe we'll just solder the chip in. In absolute worst case, we can get 
Mr. Suck on the job, and we can pull the chip back out again if we need to. Nice. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> right. <coughs> and just be good and careful with your orientation, because this one is pin one to the bottom of the board. <laughs> yes, I was just, just looking at that. All right. <coughs> Let's see what we got. Where we got? Where we got? All right. I reckon I'm going to take another very short break and then we will get these chips soldered in. So everybody stand by and we'll be back in just a sec. Awesome. All right, we're back. So I realized they actually have another big pile of these chips anyway. So absolute worst case. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll, we'll survive. So, 6.5CO2, all right, that's our CPU, very important, keep that for later. 6.5.2.2, and a 6.5.2.2. Got that in there. Oh, it feels so wrong to solder a 40-pin disc. <laughs> yeah, well, again, all the stuff back in the day, Commodore 64 or... NES or whatever, they were all uh, soldered directly to the board. I uh, know, but every time I pull one out, I always put a socket in. This is true. Makes repair easier. Yeah. Although I guess if you're manufacturing a Commodore 64 size run, then those 10 cent sockets add up. Double check, six five two two. All right. And pin one at the bottom of the board. Pin one at the bottom of the board. Nice. Were there any questions from the chat? Does anyone have anything that they want to know? Experiences with the six five zero two. I think that's one of these classic projects that the worst question I ever get asked by people who just like don't get it, they ask the question of why. And it's like, that's, that's not a valid question. Why is just because I can, you know? I like that you just outright reject the concept of being asked why and you don't even have to explain it. That seems like a good way to do this. Well, I think, I think a lot of people in the chat here, a lot of people that are following along kind of understand that like you have a crazy project. I'm going to, I'm going to build a robotic lawnmower for fun. And everyone says, why? And it's like, no, 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 not a valid question. Don't care. Um, it's, it's for the challenge. It's for the experience. It's for the fun of learning new stuff, you know? Mm. It doesn't need to serve a useful purpose when it's finished. I mean, if it turns into magic smoke, that's not quite so useful. But, like, this is not a computer that's ever going to be on the internet serving web pages or doing anything useful for society. It's going to be a box of blinking lights. Yeah, well, <clears throat> we can always get um, the Adam Dunkel's IP stack running on here and see what we page off it, I suppose. True. Um, I have thought that there's no reason I shouldn't be able to get chess working on it. I kind of want to write my own chess computer. Oh, that's uh, right. I forgot we were talking about that, yeah. Yeah, there, there was a version of micro chess written in the late 70s for the 6502. Um, so it's absolutely achievable. And um, from, from what I've read of how to do this, um, like from first principles, if you write code, you, you, you figure out a way of representing the board in memory, however you want to do that. You then write some code that figures out whether a move is valid or not. And then version of one of the code, you literally pick a random piece, pick a random move and do that. Um, and today you've got a chess computer, it's just not very good. And from there, you can start writing the how to pick the best move kind of code and build that up layer upon layer over time to make a better and better chess computer. Right. So I think that could be kind of fun to do. Yeah, that makes sense. Have you run any kind of like um, <clears throat> interactive console type stuff on yours? I don't know if you did you get to the point of getting like a serial port going? Uh, so there's no serial port on this. Um, there's enough room in the I.O. map where I could add a serial port with, like, two more chips mm. without too much trouble. Um, what I have done is written um, a cheesy little game that runs on the keypad in 7 Sigma, um, so you can actually run a little game on it. 
and that's in the demo code on GitHub. So when we get to the code from GitHub, um, yeah, it, basically it's the guessing game. The computer picks a random number, you guess your uh, yeah. number, and it says higher or lower, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I've written that, and that works quite well. I guess... But when uh, you've only got seven-segment display, the, um, the, the, the user interface is spectacularly limited. Mm -hmm. Hunt the Wumpers and Trek are probably uh, other good classic choices for this kind of um, like yep. single board setup. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Which one of the uh, I.O. chips is the... This must be the GPIO chip, right? And this is the one that's that's doing the keypad stuff. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So the, so the, what I would call the vertical one is doing the keypad stuff because it's right by those headers to the other board. Yeah. Whereas the one on the left that's more horizontal, that's running the GPIO, which is marked on the board there. Uh, so there's yeah. um, Got it. 16 pins of IO and some ground and PCC so presented on that, on that IO header. That's for... General experimentation. If we're going to blow up an IO chip, it'll be the one that's in a socket. Yes. <laughs> Good. All right. CPU. Because you shouldn't be hooking anything to that for a while anyhow until you're getting into weird little experiments. Yeah. Good. All right. Needs a little bit more pin, pin rolling. Are these CPUs expensive? I don't remember if we talked about what the cost of a of a six five zero two is in twenty twenty two. Um, they're still in that twenty dollar territory. I think they're depending on where you buy them. They're like eleven bucks US or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Not bad. For Which is kind of expensive for a chip that's coming up on fifty years old. True. But at the same time, it still puts it well in the range of if you screw one up, it's not that big a deal. True. When I when I last looked at the materials, because I've got somebody wants to start like buying kits from me. When I looked at full bullet materials, I think even with the fancy keys and keycaps and everything, bullet materials for the whole unit comes out at about one hundred and fifty bucks. Right. Um, for all of the chips, sockets, capacitors, resistors, the seven segment, all those nice mechanical clickety keys, the whole shooting match is yeah about one hundred and fifty bucks New Zealand. Not bad, especially if you uh, think about like what a Kim one or something would have cost back in the seventies. Well, exactly. Um, I mean, on the on the discussion of should I sell these as kits, the answer is maybe not. I'm going to make um, all the files available, but being in New Zealand, if I've got people overseas, I'm importing chips from yeah. the states to New Zealand to repackage them to send them to some other corner of the world. That just seems ridiculous. Yeah. So what I'm more likely to do is, at the moment, all of the ROM code is on GitHub, and I'll probably put all the, like, Gerber files and documentation on GitHub, and then anyone, anyone anywhere in the world can just locally get themselves some PCBs, order the chips, and put it together themselves. There's no point in me, like, packaging up a box with all the parts you need to ship it around the world. That just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But at the same time, I do want this to be available for anyone who wants one can build one sort of a philosophy yeah no, i think that makes makes a lot of sense really so derek have we built a computer i think you're pretty well there what you're going to need is some rom code that's on github and mm -hmm. you're going to need an led and a power supply and then you can probably make a classic blinking light all right let's let's do it let's reach for the stars see if we can get to the blinking led point I mean, I'm always amused that the first thing people do with Arduino is, you know, the classic blink code. So that, that exists for this computer as well. Cool. And then everybody in the comments gets ragey because they're like, you've spent all this money on an Arduino for a <laughs> blinking light when you could have used a 555, et yeah. cetera. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the blink code on, um, on GitHub, it proves the CPU, the RAM, the ROM, the IO are all good. Yeah. Um, and at that point, you can then... Uh, make it blink at a different speed. Um, or move on to the, the entire um, uh, UI board. Okay, well, this in the instructions, it says to connect an LED across any I.O. pin to ground. Yeah, so what I've done in the past is I used those headers on the SD card 
So that's why the why I say put the headers on the SD card, but don't right. install the SD card board because it's a perfect place to hook up jumper wire to an LED. Okay. What uh, which pin on this this connector are we are we are we looking at? I don't remember. Okay. Very good. What? If you look at if you actually pull out the SD card breakout board uh, from Adafruit, it's yes. got it's got um, markings on it. I good. think. I think ground is on the far right. right. And then it's, I think it's ground and then a 3.3 or a 5 and then you're onto the IO pins further down the, so this, further down the list. So this just sits there like that, is that right? It does. Yeah, okay, cool, cool. So, means ground is going to be pin 3 by the looks of things. And then it looks like we've just got IO pins on the left hand side there. Does that seem plausible? Yeah, that sounds about right. All right, cool. Put that on there. We'll grab an LED. Now the question is, what color do we want? Because I've got all of the LED colors. I mean, the only acceptable answer is red, because, you know. Uh, I don't know, though. I don't know. We've got green, we've got yellow, I've got orange, I've got infrared, I've got ultraviolet. I mean, infrared and ultraviolet won't be quite as useful. <laughs> Blue could be quite nice. I actually don't know if I've got blue. I've got an unlabeled mystery LED. Oh, I wish... <laughs> I had some pink LEDs. I don't know where those have gone. That would be perfect. I see a comment there of blinking LED as the hollow world of indebted devs. That is so true. Let's just check in case this is a pink LED. Um, I have a feeling this might be a... Oh, no, here are the... No, uh, yeah. So, this is a pink LED. These are really good, but this might be unsuited. <laughs> um, let's yeah, on my on my workbench, I've just got an LED that's... Oh, no, that's a bit big. Um, I've got an LED that's just got like a couple of hundred ohm load resistor on it and then straight into some um, male headers that I can just... Sorry, some female headers that I can just jump her straight onto the board, which is quite nice. <laughs> Do we need a resistor for this? I feel like we probably strictly should. I would, I would strongly recommend yes. All right, let's get into the there's, there's no, there's no current limiting coming out of the six five two two. Yeah. But I think it can only support like fifty odd milliamps before smoke happens. All right, let's do that. Set my bench PSU to something reasonable. I just want to find out what color this LED is. Sure. And that it works. That, yes, it's probably worth checking as well. Let's set this to 30 milliamps. If we're lucky, it'll be one of those um, flashing color changing LEDs that just does. That, that, that just could does be all the colors of the rainbow. RGB yeah. unicorn vomit. All right. I was actually at JK yesterday and... Oh, um, it's just blue. <laughs> it's disappointing. Um, I was at JK yesterday and they had these tiny little boards that are called LED rafts and it's a really tiny board with just an LED on it but it's all the colours of the rainbow that you can then um, programmatically select what colour you want, which sounds really nice except they come with absolutely no documentation anywhere. Right. Which is kind of frustrating. Oh, that sounds like it would be part of the fun. I just can't understand how they can sell stuff with absolutely zero documentation. I don't know if that's coming through. Oh, it doesn't come through on the camera that well, but these um, these vibrant pink LEDs are really good. It kind of looks red on camera. Yeah, yeah. it's really hard to get the spectrum right, but I like these a lot. Anyway. I reckon, I reckon we don't use either of those. Uh, design decisions, you know, lots of design decisions. I can't believe this is the hardest part. <laughs> oh, what's this? Okay, hold on. Oh, uh, that's an ultraviolet. Uh, that's probably not good. Yeah, Trog's talking about the flickering fire LEDs. They're pretty cool. 
in the last few years, you can now just buy an LED that gives you that flickering fire effect, but, yeah. but no effort, which is kind of awesome. That is pretty cool. All right, I've got one more mystery LED, uh, which I want to find out in case it's, in case it's cool. Oh, it's a, it's a black light LED. Damn it. Right. I mean, it shows up on camera and it would prove it's working. No, there's only one sensible way forward here. You need a red LED. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. That'll do. All right. One of the amusing problems I had along the journey was um, at one point for convenience, I was actually powering the entire computer off like um, one of those like phone charge power bank things because I didn't have a desktop supply handy and I couldn't have it hooked to anything else. So it just hooked to a power bank. Um, and I got the machine up and running and after about 30 seconds, it just stopped. Like everything stopped. So I got in there with a multimeter and I'm like... How have I wedged the machine so badly that it just stopped? It turned out that the power bank stops delivering power uh, if you're drawing less than about 40 milliamps. Yeah, I've run into that exact problem before, yeah. Which kind of blew my mind that the entire computer running was drawing less than 40 milliamps. Yeah. Um, the, the CPU RAM ROM draws like a stupidly tiny amount of power. The actual power consumption of this entire machine is... Um, the LEDs. Yeah, it's a nice problem to have, I guess, right? And to some extent, the SD card. When you're reading and writing from the SD card, that, that draws um, uh, like a dozen or more milliamps. But yeah, just the CPU rocking along was like five milliamps or something stupid. I guess the, uh, the Western design folks haven't wasted completely the intervening time then in improving the... 6502. I think the 6502 was always fairly power efficient back in the day, but yeah, it's, it's yeah. It's pretty chill these days. All right, I'm just making the ugliest thing you've ever seen. Trim off the bits that stick out and that'll be fine. I don't know. I think it's, it's going to stay ugly. It's a test, Harness. What do you expect? No, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Might not even be that ugly. Cover it in heat shrink. That hides all the crimes. True, true. Give it a coat of paint. Cool. I so often end up with my LEDs wired backwards so they don't work anyhow. I am going to double check this before we commit to it, so don't worry about that. Ta-da! Give it some juice. Let's give it five volts and see what it's uh, see what the current draw looks like. None. Surely not. Oh no, it's on. It's a very sad LED. Alright, good. Yes, it's maybe it'll be quite dim. Yeah, right. that barely shows that. on camera, but it'll be enough to prove the point. Perfect. It's nineteen seventy spec. This probably wasn't a very bright LED to start with. Yeah. Okay. Am I hearing some native birds in the back of your uh and your audio now? Yes, I live very near to Zealandia. Um if you're familiar with that in Wellington, which is a big native bird eco sanctuary, and so a lot of the birds come and hang out here as well, which is very nice. Nice. All right. 
I guess we just need to arrange power and get some code on the ROM. So, yep. let's bring in Mr. Examples if socket here from earlier. In there. I just loaned this programmer out actually, um, and I haven't used it since I got it back. So, I might actually. I also don't have the software for this installed, so we're, we're embarking on another odyssey now that is possibly going to be as complicated as building the entire rest of this computer, which is, is the software for this available for macOS? Yeah, I was going to say, I tend to do my development on Linux, so how you go on macOS, I don't know. Yeah, well, let's see what we got. If anyone has used a mini pro with macOS and knows where to get the software from. Oh, Mac Ports has the mini pro command line tool. That will probably so work. That's what I use on Linux. Yeah, nice. All right. While that does its business, we will grab the go visit the GitHub. Now, I've given you raw source, which, again, you may or may not be able to get it compiled up the MacOS. So, if push comes to shove, I can email you the bin file. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Actually, my computer says it's going to need another 163 hours um, to install Xcode. So, let's fire up a Linux VM instead. Oh, it installed anyway. All right, well, in 95 hours, we might have a Xcode installed, but it doesn't seem to have mattered. Cool, Mini Pro is working. That's good. I know this is thrilling watching on the stream. Alias 6502. Compiler. Let's see if VBCC is available. Okay. Is VBCC in um, any of the like Debian package manager? Would I be able to apt install it in Debian? Uh, no idea. I found it on um, Arch without any trouble. Right. And so I'm assuming it probably kicks around for Debian as well. Okay. Let's grab the source code for VBCC and see how far we get. As a worst case, I can email you a bin file. Well, let's see if we can do this the, well, let's see, the see if we can do this the honest way first. I wonder if I can, can I safely share my terminal without immediately doxing myself? <laughs> <laughs> Possibly not. All right, let's see what we got. So I'll explain some of what's going on behind the scenes for those who can't see the terminal. Um, VBCC is a sort of multi-platform compiler by a German guy, and it's you can find it over at uh, compilers.de, um, and it, it'll cross-compile for many of the really old 8-bit um, uh, CPUs and such like. All of the actual ROM stuff that I've written for this project is on GitHub. Um, so Frenchman's just going to get the weird compiler and then get clone my code, compile it, get himself a bin file and put it on the EEPROM. Let's try. The bytes because all it does is blink the LED but it still puts out an actual 32K file because you're going to burn it to a 32K ROM. Right, that's quite handy. 
Like the actual, the actual code size is, I don't know, like 30 odd bytes. Hopefully you can see me on the webcam now. We can. We can see you and we're starting to see your um, desktop environment where you may or may not dox yourself. <laughs> All right, let's see how we go. Let's see how we go. I've just jumped into a um, Linux VM to improve my odds because I think Xcode is not properly installed on my... Uh, on my Mac, but that's all right. But I think that's just a make file. We don't have to configure it or anything, so. Yeah, I read how it was pretty lightweight and easy. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should read the instructions. Right, installation for Unix. And I'm pleased that this compiler has instructions for how to build it for Amiga OS as well. I mean, it, it's been around for years and it's designed around weird old machines, so, you know. I feel like we need to set an environment variable that tells it what to actually build. The instructions are not very clear. The, the readme seems to assume that you've already compiled it. Let's just go and see how Arch builds it. That might be the easiest way. Did you say it was available in AUR or is it in, in Arch proper? Uh, might have been in Arch proper, come to think of it. Did we? There was a static binary. I wonder if we've got a. I'm guessing they don't have a, an ARM sixty four. Oh, there is an ARM. Be very convenient. Well, would you look at that? Uh, of course, it's 32 bit arm, isn't it? Well, that was close. I mean, you know, it is compiling for 8 bit CPUs. It doesn't need to be. <laughs> um, okay, that's all right. How about instead of doing that, we go find another machine? I 
is AC Express Sales. Ah, I, um, I switched tabs in my terminal and uh, yeah, Night Scud, you are correct. If you don't know what to do, reading the Arch documentation is an excellent way of doing this. I switched tabs in my terminal and OBS lost a view of what we were doing. I did see the joke not that long ago, something about Arch has great documentation and it happens to come with an operating system. Yeah. I actually didn't even want the documentation. I just wanted to look at their package build recipe to see what what um, how they actually build it. But that's fine. We've got I've got other computers, as they say. Success. All right. Let's grab your source code. Cool. 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 Okay. Right. So we want the test ROM, link to this. Ah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> cool. Let's have a look at the link to this. All right, what are we doing? Setting up the stack. You've got a routine that sleeps for about a second. Okay. You're sitting in an infinite loop here, sleeping. Okay, makes sense. Writing to the IO and sleeping in a loop. Seems reasonable to me. It basically waggles all of the IO pins, which means it doesn't really matter where you put your mm. LED, it'll still go blinky blinky. Very nice. And then in the um, main readme for the for my project, got the correct command line flags to make the compiler do the right thing. Cool. Look at all this code we built. Truly immense program. All right. Excellent. Let's see if we can get that onto a ROM chip. Yeah, so it's, so it's a whole 67 bytes of meaningful code, but it's <laughs> yeah. still a... Uh, so it's still a 32k um, binary file because, you know, EEPROM. Yep. No, that's cool. Cool. I guess we can see if Mini Pro. So we probably should blank this thing first, right? You want to do what? Sorry. We should probably blank the chip first, right? Uh, no, no. I've always found you just say Mini Pro flash this thing and it takes care of it. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> So we just do, what is this chip? It's a 25C256, was it? Yep. No, 28C256. So um, minipro P8E28C256 minus WA.L, and off it goes. So literally I give it a minus P with the chip and a minus W with the file and let it roll. Cool. Like that, you don't need a particular suffix. 
No, just AT twenty eight C two five six. Cool. And then it's what, just dash W I think for the Yep. Alright. Throw our chip in there and see what happens. Oh hey, that looks promising. Oh I see, it doesn't erase as part of the right. Yeah, yeah. No, it cleans it all up and it does a verify up to the right too. Oh gosh. Oh, that was a lot easier than I was worried about. Alright, back to the workbench. Okay. So in theory, our uh, chip is ready to go. And there, and then we just need five volts, which can be arranged. We'll just do this in the sketchiest, the sketchiest possible way. <laughs> it's fine. Actually, no. Let's solder some more. Yeah, just just put straight on. It'll be yeah, fine. Yeah, right, we'll just do it. We'll do it. Don't lie. Uh, just gonna do that. And then I will grab something non conductive. Um, yeah, look, easy. It's basically a connection. Super professional. Yeah, cool. All right, so in theory, if I plug this in, we should have a blinking light. Um, That's the philosophy. Oh, if it's very tense. Alright, we'll turn the, kill the lights so we can see what's going on. And um, keep, keep an eye on the current though. Alright, mm, I'm drawing 300 milliamps. That sounds a little on the high side. Yeah, I'm gonna pull that. Okay, something is shorted. I have a feeling it might just be this though. Give everything a quick feel. Something feels warm. Make sure that we don't have any little solder blobs. Okay, let's try that again. No, something is unhappy. All right, now we get to try and figure out what has gone wrong. I think this is also an interesting part of the part of the work is you know the fault finding and diagnostics aspect oh, of it. You know what I've done, Derek. <laughs> you were saying about getting the polarity wrong. Would you like me to mark it on the board in a bigger font? <laughs> All right. I mean, to be fair, I've been watching the stream and didn't notice you had it backwards, but, you know. I'm using, all right, let's get this in here. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't notice that mistake, but That's I did okay. think I lay it pretty clearly. That's all right. That's all right. As I said earlier, the chips are pretty tolerant to dumb stuff. Okay. So we're drawing a much more reasonable amount of uh, current now, looking about 30 milliamps. I'm... So you could jab the reset button and see if that helps the situation. Ooh, nearly there, come on! Is it going to blink though? Did we kill it? That's the question. Okay, I'm turning on the oscilloscope. Yeah, per permanently on LED does not sound quite right. Oh, except I don't have a power cable for the oscilloscope. Oh no. <laughs> oh, we're so close. We're so close. All right, let's just make sure everything's in its sockets properly. Hopefully that little brief reverse, uh, reverse polarity incident hasn't cooked anything too badly. Let's, um, Okay, just for the sake of things that are easy to te check, let's just check that the ROM is still good. Yeah, I've um, I've done backwards polarity without any major damage, but yeah, you could you could try reflashing the ROM. Mm. Let's do that. 
you know, very easy to do. Yeah, no, we'll do the easy things first. Well, still writes okay. Sweet. Yeah, read back okay. LED is just stuck on. Although it does go off during reset, which seems like a good sign to me. Go. I wonder if, where did the pin out reference go? Which pin have I actually got this on? I've got it on. Yeah, I'm wondering if you want to check where your LED is hooked up. I've got it between the chip select line and ground. Is it possible? Yeah, that should work. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I wonder if the clock is running. Might just see. Another question is where is my multimeter? <laughs> All right, stand by, folks. I'm just going to go and see if I can grab my multimeter. Grab a pin out for the 6502. Where is the clock? I think the clock is pin th 37. Help me out here, Derek. Should I? Where should I be seeing clock pulses on the six five zero two? Uh yeah, pin thirty seven should be good. Okay. So let's just check and make sure that we're getting power to the CPU first. So let's take a ground off here. That's going to be. Pin eight. eight. Okay, that looks good. Um, forty eighty nine. I'm slightly confused that you're getting the light coming on mm -hmm. at all because the light should only come on. Like, when you hit reset, the light should be on an off state until it is set definitively as on. Right. So which we've seen, does surprise me. I'm seeing one megahertz clock at the CPU, oh. which is good. Um, if, you're, if we're running in a loop, are we going to be... We should have some bus activity, right? Yep, both data bus and address bus should be busy doing stuff. Yeah, I'll just grab my logic probe. Make sure nothing's getting warm. So the uh, uh, question in chat is maybe the code is toggling a different pin. Um, the code is written for testing that it puts all of the I.O. pins high and then all of the I.O. pins low. So basically any of the I.O. pins should be waggling at roughly one second interval. My supreme fine quality eBay brand logic pro. So, yeah, always good. Um, 
see if we're seeing anything here. Okay, well that's obviously high. So let's just look at address bit zero. Where's that pin nine? We should be going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so the, the chip is clocking because we've got the pulse light on here. Um, so there's obviously something happening there. going between 0 and 1, which is nice. So the CPU seems to be running, which is good. But we're stuck high on that data line. We'll just check some of the other data lines while we're in here. Stuck high, stuck high, stuck high. Do you want to take the LED off completely, like un yeah. um, remove your whole header assembly Good idea. and probe the IO pins directly? Yeah. Still stuck high even without the LED. Okay. So we're coming off this chip. Maybe if we look at the IO pins off this chip, because it should be driving both of these. Uh, the code is written only for the I.O. chip uh, on the right-hand side of the board, but you could change the code fairly easily. Okay. The other thing I would do is maybe just double-check the soldering under that I.O. chip and see if yeah, you've got a Yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's just give it a quick visual inspection before we get too excited. All right, what do we got? Looks all good over that side. Looks all good. Yeah, it looks okay to me. I mean, there's a bit of flux. I don't know. I wouldn't have thought that would be too much of an issue. Let's just see if there's any other bridges or anything. It looks okay to me. So, in terms of turning that those ports on and off, that would involve that involves writes to the data bus, right, on the six seven two. Actually, something I'd like you to try is, can you power up the board without the ROM chip in at all? Uh -huh. Because that point it's got no code to run, right? Yeah. If the LED is still coming on, then we've got something more fundamental and electrical going on. All right, that's a good call. Because the LED should remain off until instructed to go high by code. Yeah. So if we make sure that there is no code to run, yeah. um, you shouldn't get an LED coming on. That sounds like a good check. And indeed, the LED does not come on. But I can see 10 milliamps or so of current draw, so I'd say the machine's probably running. Okay. Let's also just quickly check that these chips actually fully went into their sockets and that there aren't any bent over pins, because that's always a good trap. Yeah, so my next thought is it executes, um, the code sets the IO pin high, mm -hmm. which is LED comes on, and then it jumps into a subroutine to count off the time. So if your, ROM is da if your RAM is damaged, then it can't do anything on the stack. Yeah, yeah, I'm just wondering, because this RAM is not perfectly in this socket, actually. Right. That would be nice. Yeah, I'm wondering whether the yeah, I'm wondering whether the ROM is turning on the LED and then running off into undefined behaviour. Yeah. Let's just reset the RAM quickly. Because that would definitely explain our symptoms. Okay. Let's make sure we didn't cook any of the pins.
So you don't have a fancy chip extractor, you're just using a screwdriver, right? Oh, I do have a chip extractor. I'm not even using a screwdriver, it's just a spudger tool, but... I don't know, chip extractors it always feels a little bit like a gamble to me. I prefer to just pull things out gently if I can. Yep. Yep. Although I did see activity on address zero, so the CPU is obviously not crashed. Like it's still zooming around through the address space. Yeah, I mean, the CPU doesn't really lock up. As it, 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 yeah, it'll just keep do, trying to do stuff. Mm. It might not be to be anything useful. Yeah. <sighs> we could have killed the RAM, although we can check it with this programmer as well. I might, yep. do that. I might do that as well. All That's right. a good point. Yeah, the, the reverse polarity could have could have killed the RAM. Yeah, still no blink. All right. I feel like the RAM's probably the least stout of these chips, frankly. Um, do you want to push the reset button once you've got power on? Because that reset circuit is still a bit iffy as well. Right, yeah, no. Same LEDs, just... The on full. All right, let's, um, just because it's easy, let's just quickly chuck the RAM in and do a test. Although, do you know, yeah. I don't know if the command line version of the mini pro software can do chip testing. I don't know. Yeah, don't know. All right. The, Windows... the, other thing that's, the other thing that's got possibilities is it probably wouldn't take many lines of code to change the blink routine to be uh, ROM only. Yeah. Yeah, I have a feeling that this mini pro tool can't do RAM check. Uh, so at the moment it does it does the jump into the sleep long. So if you pull out sleep long mm. completely, and instead of jump sleep long, you just put in a couple of knobs, um, it won't need the stack and it won't need any RAM. Yeah, I'm just thinking about... It won't sleep for very long, but it won't need any RAM. Yeah, if we and can get some vibration on that. And see if it's changing. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. All right. So we have got the JSR sleep long put in um, half a dozen knots. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's do that. And yeah, it'll blink fast enough that you won't be able to see it blink, but your logic probe will pick it up. And then you'll know that, because yeah, then you can run it without RAM and it should be fine. Not if I put in heaps of knobs. Well, you have got 32K to play with. <laughs> Let's put Sorry, in a... 60K. I'm putting in a hundred. Yeah, you've got lots of space to play with, so yeah. I'm putting in a hundred and eighty-two oh, knobs, which is probably still not going to make any difference, but. Oops! Ah, oh, that was dumb. Nope, 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 nope. What this code needs is a hundred and eighty-two knobs. All right, let's try build that instead. Well, it produced a longer program, so it's clearly what we needed. Excellent. You know you should have put in um, 182 knobs. I did put but in... You a, like 182, right? I did put in 182 knobs. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah. I wasn't counting. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
uh, this is part of the design of, um, you know, let, let's let's test the I/O, the CPU, the RAM, the ROM all at mm -hmm. once. Well, now we're just going to test it without the RAM. No, it's good. This is good. I've never actually written the code to run without RAM, but I'm pretty sure that should be doable. Come on, OBS. What are you doing? OBS does not like it when you switch tabs in terminal. All right, well, that's fine. We've seen programming this thing already before, so let's just run that. Chip is in, good. Verification failed. Uh, maybe I shouldn't hold on to it while it's doing it. You're trying to program a ROM sh a RAM chip there, by the way. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, let's put the correct chip into the programmer. Thank you, Derek. All right, I will say this Ziff socket is extremely nice in the board. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Very good decision there. All right, I'll put the RAM back in, just in case. Rom in. All right. Should be ready to go. Is it? LED is not on. Okay. It looks a little bit less bright. Does well, that could be because it's going blinky blink. I don't know, blink. but that might just be because that's what I want to see. So let's get the logic probe on here. Oh, now it's pulsing. All right. So you probably can't see that. Let me just shuffle the board back into view. So I think we probably cooked the RAM, unfortunately. It's so either the cooked see. RAM or you might have a, um, well, I guess if you had a short anywhere in the socket for the RAM, um, then it would corrupt the pass. So yeah, I think you've just cooked the RAM. Well, that's not too bad. We can live with that. Yeah, that's not the end of the world. Yeah, we've built ourselves an almost functional computer. Excellent. If you put in a if you put in a whole mess more knobs, um Yeah, let's um let's put more knobs in. That's the solution to all of life's problems. Actually, have you got a slower clock source you can put in? Because that would also get you up blinking at a better speed. Yes. Because you're gonna need you're gonna need in the Hundred thousand knobs territory, which you can't do in ROM. Yes, and we don't have a stack, so we can't do any kind of magical loops. Yeah. Uh, yes, we do have a slower clock source. We got this guy. So um, yeah, let's hook that up and see if that's going to do it for us. Uh, now, what does this need? Power. This one hurts. Get a small screwdriver. Oh, there's no screw in that one. <laughs> That's the one I want to use, though. That's not fair. All right, uh, we'll just we'll just do that. So if you're taking off that clock header pin, yeah, um, you inject your own clock signal on the right hand side. The pin closest to the crystal is just what comes out of the crystal. If that makes sense. Right. Cool. Okay. So if we fed this at say one kilohertz. Yeah. 
that that might get you on the ballpark. Half a kilohertz. All right. Well, conveniently, that's what this clock generator is already set up to do. So, how are we going to get there? Actually, no. The clock generator is not set up for that. Hang on. Why is this reading? Okay, I think I'm going to pause the stream for just a moment, get things hooked up, and then we'll be right back with you. Awesome. Okay, we're back. I found my big box of these, which is what we're going to need to hook this up. Um, so, Derek, what was the what was your reckoning on the calculations? Uh, if you give it a clock of about one kilohertz, you should get a light that blinks at a respectable pace, based on your 182 knobs. Great. What's happening with this signal generator? It'd be very convenient if I had my oscilloscope working. Is your logic probe on the right ground reference? Yeah, both of these things are on the same on the same supply, so it should be fine. Okay. This is not a particularly flash signal generator, but generally works. Sine wave, that's five. Hmm. Hmm. What is going on? What is going on here? Maybe the path of least resistance here is to just get the oscilloscope going so we can see what's actually happening. Let me just see if I've got a power cable that can go into there. Does your oscilloscope have a signal generator built in by any chance, or some kind of reference signal? Uh, it does have a one kilohertz output, which would be pretty convenient for this. Um, Wouldn't it just? The problem is, the problem is, do I have a power cable? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why I decided at some point to unplug the oscilloscope, and now I have no idea where the power cable for it is. We're getting into the bin situation under the desk. So while you go look at while you go looking for power cables, does the peanut gallery have any opinions as to whether I need to add a like a protection diode to the to the power input so that we can't go frying RAM chips in the future? Like that seems like a ten cent solution to a problem that really does seem to exist. I'm kind of impressed that I managed to get this far down the project without me needing to get an oscilloscope. 
Um, I mean, I, at one point I did, oh, yeah, full bridge rectify. Yeah, okay, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I, I think full, full bridge, bridge rectify is like, yeah, a bit overkill, but I guess it is. Uh, if I buy like one of those all at once, that's a one component fix. Yeah, I did buy a, a, a like a cheap, crappy software oscilloscope from um, JCAR about a year ago. And it just was not worth the grief. I couldn't make it play nice or do anything useful. And yes, if I put in a bridge rectifier, you get a voltage drop. Even if I put in just a protection diode, you get a voltage drop. Although I did see somebody avoid that. They put the diode in the other way around, like backwards, reverse bias with a fuse. So that if you hook up the power normally, it works. And if you hook up the power backwards... It shorts out the power supply and blows the fuse, which I guess is one way of doing it, but it doesn't seem very user-friendly. All right. So let's go for this running. See how many more clip leads we can attach to one another down here. <laughs> well, you don't need the logic probe anymore, probably. Probably not. We probably don't need the logic probe at this point. I'm not familiar with the phrase of a crowbar diode. It's basically I'm guessing that's the you put it in backwards and let everything catch fire. I don't know. It's basically what you were describing, yeah. A crowbar right. circuit okay. kind of like protection circuit that, that kicks in to protect to um clamp a voltage rather than uh Yeah. Cause yeah, I do, I do think some kind of reverse voltage protection for this board would be a nice idea, being that it's sort of aimed at people who might not have built stuff before. So a screw is missing from the terminal block, so I'm just going to take out another screw. <laughs> and I'll just move that. There we go. Easy. Okay, something MOSFET. But yeah, um, our whole MOSFET thing is a bit overkill. <clears throat> yeah. Have you thought about going into the business of yak shaving as a as a professional, like, you know? Is that question directed at me, Derek? Yes, you because do seem to be covered in yak shavings right now. I am already a professional yak shaver. There's no hope for me. <laughs> okay. The signal generator is outputting a constant 5 volts, exactly as it should be. I would take the signal reference off the off the oscilloscope if that exists. Although I guess that's not always five volt peak to peak, is it? Yeah, I don't really know what the output characteristics of the of the test square wave are on my oscilloscope. Um, I'd rather get the switch. You could measure it with your oscilloscope. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's it probably doesn't have very much drive impedance and stuff. So um, true. Well, I have a, I'm beginning to wonder if maybe my um, my little signal generator is cooked as well. Should be a bit sad. Because the amplitude knob doesn't do anything. That's probably a bad sign. I mean, we did discuss at the beginning that you can clock this thing down to zero, so you could single stack by. Like, put a clicky switch directly on your um, clock pin and just yeah. like it by hand. I feel like it would be too noisy. I suspect it'll be kind of, um, it'll be a bit too sizzly. We might not catch the, uh, catch the but actual, This is true. This is true. The actual things. Um, all right, let's just take the one kilohertz off my, um, off my scope. Why not? I want to see this LED what's, flash. What's, what's the worst that could happen, you know? Yeah, exactly. Just brick my precious oscilloscope for uh, for the entertainment of people on the internet. Okay. So 
So which which pin do I want to be injecting the clock into? Uh, right, right hand side. The pin closest to the crystal is the crystal. The pin furthest from the crystal runs down to the rest of the board. Okay. So we inject the clock here. Yes. I'm just going to bring the oscilloscope closer. There's now a square wave in chat, but I don't believe it's one kilohertz, so, you know. <laughs> That's very kind, though. Uh, I do appreciate it. Okay, what do we got? Let's just measure that. Okay, yep, that looks square wavy. Yep, square wave seems to be in there. Um, how sure were you about the, the pin, Derek? Yep, yeah, pretty confident that's where you should be putting your clock in. Again, you could. Check it back over on pin 37 on CPU. Yeah, let's do that. So I'm not getting any blinking now. A question in chat of do we need to inhibit the crystal? Uh, I have no idea. I've never done this bit before. In theory, the crystal is still rocking along at one megahertz, but it's not feeding to anywhere else. Okay, so there's definitely one kilohertz landing on that um, on the CPU pin now. Cool, cool, cool. But I don't know if this this might not have enough juice, like output impedance, to drive. Everything. Everything, yeah. Because it's not really designed. Although, the signal looks well, alright on the scope. Now that, now that you've got your scope up and running, you could put the jumper back on and run the crystal and put the scope on the, down by the LED. Yeah. And see what kind of signal you've got down there. Yeah, let's do that. Alright, LED is on a little bit, which is good. Low duty cycle. Scope is still grounded to the circuit, which is convenient. Grab that pin and see what that pin has to say. Alright, well we've got a nice looking square wave on the scope. You'll have to take my word for it. Um, but it's definitely turning the thing on and off. So I'm pretty confident that we're running. Um, so now what you could do for fun is change the number of knobs by an order of magnitude and see if you can change the speed of the blinkies. Yeah, so the blinking is currently blinking at one kilohertz. Um, Let's just make a really, really horrible program. Yeah, I mean, if you pull out half your knobs and see if it goes twice as fast, you know? There are now 20 times as many knobs. Right. The program is now 7 kilobytes of knobs. Wow, you're using up half the ROM just to make an LED blink. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. ROM's coming out. ROM is in the programmer.
Yeah, spare RAM, I don't think, um, I don't think Fincham's got any spare RAM. I've definitely got spare RAM here at my place, which I can deliver sometime during the week. Well, we've gotten further than I was planning to anyway, so I'm still calling this a success, even if I cooked the RAM. Yeah, no, I mean, there's no smoke and no flame, so that's a win, you know? <laughs> True. Alright. ROM's in there, let's see what we got. Okay, that definitely reduced the blink frequency. What have we got now? We're now blinking at a mere 68 hertz. So, if I just put in six times more knobs... You'll run out of ROM space. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, it should still be possible to make a loop. Yeah, I was just going to say... Jumping subroutine, you can make a loop indexed off... A register... Um, off a register and still not need to deal with RAM. Yeah. Yeah, you could probably do something like that without too much grief. Yeah, let's have a look. Let's get these knobs out of here. Yeah, there's a comment in chat, because of your camera and frame rate and compression and stuff, you can kind of actually see it like a slight beating as it forms a beat frequency against the, the 60 hertz of your camera. Awesome. Which is kind of cool. So, yeah, you are definitely in that 60 hertz territory. Yeah. Yeah, it's like 68 hertz. Nice. So, in a perfect world, like an 8 hertz beat frequency or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I've got heaps of I've got heaps of static RAMs, but they're um, they're a different chip size to the this one. I mean, all you've got to do is Jerry rig an adapter to show you. Ah, there we go. All right, good. We're back into Vim. I just want to show you the wrong window for some reason. So we're back. So one of the one of the um one of the demo projects in GitHub is actually a clock. Where I'm instead of trying to figure out how many knobs to get one second, I'm actually using the um, timer function of the six five two two to raise and interrupt to drive a clock, and I found that to be surprisingly accurate for all just bodged together. I'm getting down to within two or three seconds a day of true and correct, which is pretty cool. So but it also proves like how to raise interrupts and in hardware and all of that magic. If I just but we can't do that today because it needs RAM because interrupts. If I just inline your sleep function and change the labels, that should work, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. Hang on. I mean, it's just a, it's just an inside-outside loop, both yeah. counting to 512, which, uh, both counting to, um, 256, which gets you, like, 65,000 times round the loop with some knots in the middle and blah -de blah So, yeah, as you're, yeah, you're right, just inline it. Yeah, let's do that. So much better than a couple of hundred knobs. Uh, I really wanted the 182 knobs to be the right number, but... I mean, if you... Yeah. Yep, no, you're good. Keep going. Yeah, we're back to a much more reasonable program size as well, which is nice. Very nice. Oh, you've got a um, the bit that you stole for inlining, you've got an RTS in there that's going to cause you trouble because it's no longer a subroutine. Yes, yes, yes. Very fine point. Let's fix that quickly. Sorry, you, you have to appreciate that I'm watching the video stream about 30 seconds. I know. Yeah, you're doing quite well video. considering. Yeah. I only see your mistakes well after you made them. <laughs> All right. Power off. ROM out. Into the programmer.
Okay, Mini Pro. back in all right are you ready oscilloscope probe fell off which is what we want it blinks <laughs> we have achieved blinking all right, I'm calling that good. We got to the blinky light phase on building that. And frankly, you can't, you can't achieve a whole lot more without um, having some RAM. Indeed. Um, I don't know. RAM's overrated. We got registers. That's a kind of RAM. We got bytes. We got whole bytes of memory available to us. Easy. Yeah, I, I've got a whole fat 32 file system implementation that needs, you know, <laughs> RAM. All right. Good. I'm going to go and rummage around. I might actually even have some RAM, but I think that'll do for today's stream. So thank you very much, Derek. It's been great of you to sit and, and, and assist and chat the last few hours. And thank you, everybody it else been fun. who came to hang out with us today. Um, next time around, we'll probably have RAM that works and uh, we can assemble the keypad and we can start running some programs on the alias 6502. Um, any final word from you, Derek? Um, I don't have a link handy right now, but yeah, um, I've got a bit of a write-up on my blog and codes on GitHub. Board designs will be on GitHub. It's all very slow progress as I have free time, which, you know, I don't. But the intention is to make this as open source and available as possible. Fantastic. So if anyone likes what they see, then, you know, you can have your own at some point. Cool. I'll, I'll send out a message wherever you found out about this stream. I will also link uh, Derek's blog and GitHub and things. Yeah. All right. Very good. Enjoy the rest of your long weekend if you're local. And if not, we'll catch you on the next stream, which might be in a week or two. All right. Goodbye. Bye.